We're gonna start with the latest and the greatest. Number 10 is the latest Saqqara discoveries. So on January 26th of 2023, after a year long excavation of the notorious Saqqara necropolis, two ancient tombs that date back to the fifth and sixth dynasty of the Old Kingdom are unveiled to the public. Zahi Hawass, who isn't my favorite person to cite, gave a statement on one of the mummies found. Kanohe de Defe was a inspector of officials, supervisor of nobles, and a priest in the pyramid complex of Unas. Mehdi had many titles, one of them being the Keeper of Secrets, which is a title you'll hear again later in this video. This would also be a great time to take a second and subscribe to The Hive if you're a fan of discoveries such as these. Also found was a stone sarcophagus with a mummified man named Fatek, but the most important of the dusty corpses found was a gold leaf covered mummy. Hekashepis was found down a 15 meter burial shaft inside a large rectangular limestone sarcophagus. While other mummies have been found with this unusual coding choice, Hekashepis gets to take seniority. This mummy is the oldest complete mummy covered in gold, Hawass said in an interview having led the excavation himself. The excavation team also found dozens of other valuable artifacts including statues, some of which still have their original paint intact, as well as amulets, coins, earrings, rings, and tablets, all of which are currently being displayed at the Step Pyramid of Hauser in Saqqara. Number 9 is the Tomb Special of Collecting Crocs. Archaeologists excavating the Thebian necropolis in Egypt made an extraordinary but unusual discovery which was announced on December 20th of 2022. Nine crocodile heads placed inside two tombs belonging to high ranking nobles. Archaeologist Patrick Chudzik told the Newsweek that the discovery was the first of its kind as crocodile remains have never been discovered inside the tombs of Egypt despite usually being found inside of temples or special catacombs. Dr. Chudzik explains in our case things are different. Firstly, only the heads and not the entire bodies of these Nile reptiles have been have been deposited in these tombs where we work. Secondly, they were not mummified, only wrapped in linen. There is a significant difference in this as no preservatives were used. Finally, the remains were found in the tombs of humans, not catacombs of sacred animals. The tombs belonged to two top officials during the reign of the pharaoh Nehefetre, Mentohalpet II. One being the Chancellor Cheti, a high official, but the occupant of the second tomb is actually still anonymous to us. Placing of the crocodile heads in the tombs according According to Dr. Chudzik, certainly it was unusual but not entirely unprecedented. He believes that earlier researchers paid scant attention to such finds that depict cultural practices but weren't treasures, stating that it's likely similar offerings had been placed in quite a few other tombs of rich individuals, but those offerings were discarded by the earlier researchers who discovered them. Number 8 is about the Ramesid Cemetery. So in April of 2023, the joint Dutch-Italian archaeological mission of the Saqqara Archaeological Site discovered the tomb of a person called Banhishia from the Ramesid period, the chief servant of the tomb of a ten. Alongside his tomb was the discovery of four small chapels, reinforcing the previous theories that suggest the reuse of the space between the tombs of the 18th dynasty in later eras and the constructions of tombs and chapels in that area during the Ramesid period of Egypt. The cemetery is a self-contained temple, having its own entrance and inner courtyard, as well as an underground burial chamber. Oddly, out of two out of those four chapels I mentioned were in dedication of a person that they don't recognize called Yo-Yo. Endless inscriptions and scenes on the walls are distinguished by their accuracy and quality of detail. One in particular shows a scene of funerary procession of Yo-Yo and the process of reviving his mummy again in the hereafter to live in the afterlife as a god, in addition to a scene depicting the cow goddess Hathor and a boat of the god Sekera, the god of the underworld. Inside the tomb, the mission found a Stella picture of Banhasi and his wife Baya, the singer of Amun, before a table of sacrifice and several drawings of priests and animals. While some have warriors, others have the terracotta inscriptions, which is number seven. The Egyptian Ministry of Tourism and, Inqui and Antiquities announced another discovery in Saqqara, March 17th, 2022. As the title of the video reveals, it's very obviously tombs, specifically five of them. All burials date to either Old Kingdom or the first transition slash intermediate period roughly 4,700 to 4,000 years ago. All belong to top officials and dignitaries from respective time periods and are in good state of preservation. Eity, one of the top nobles of the court, had a well-defined pathway leading to his burial room with the walls adorned with engraved pictures of many funeral scenes painted in bright terracotta and sandstone. Artistically, the colors of the paintings are considered royal colors by officials. Grave number two belonged to the wife of a man named Yart. Meanwhile, grave number three belonged to a person named Bobby Farahafe, 
who used to occupy several important court positions, namely supervisor of the great house, the chanting priest, and the cleaner of the house. The fifth cemetery is a man called Hanu, who had many titles, such as the mayor. And the sixth grave, however, is the most interesting of them, as it has the archaeologist a little giddy. A woman called Betty, who is responsible for the king's makeup, appearance, and dressing, and was buried with tons of her cosmetic tools. Allegedly, she is also a priestess of Hathor, who's the goddess of love, beauty, music, fertility, and pleasure. You want to hear something crazy? Number six is how they cracked open a tomb and found a hundred sealed coffins. It was announced on the 14th of November 2020. It's the largest find of that year. It's a hundred sealed coffins and over 40 statues alongside hundreds of mixed artifacts. Naturally, they're discovered at the Saqqara necropolis and carbon dating tells us that the items date back to the Ptolematic dynasty that ruled Egypt for some 300 years from about 320 BC to 30 BC and the late period. The coffins were found inside a burial shaft that had not been opened at all for 2,500 years. The preliminary studies revealed quickly that most of these coffins belonged to 26 dynasty priests, top officials, and elites. A number of wooden statues and colored gilded masks were also found, all in really great condition, and 28 of the statuettes are of Pates Sokar, the main god of the Saqqara necropolis. But there's one very special and unusual statue in this tomb, a bronze statue of the god Nefertam. The statue is inlaid with valuable precious stones. We're talking red agate, turquoise, jade, and lupus lazuli. It is 35 centimeters tall and has the name of its owner, Badi Amunis, engraved in its base like Andy in Toy Story. Number five, fake beards. I can't grow a beard, so maybe I'll just start rocking the, the fake one. You know, like Hatshepsut. Long before Cleopatra, Hatshepsut was the first woman to obtain power as a pharaoh. She was the sixth pharaoh of the 18th dynasty. There were just a few that were women in total, but during her reign back in the mid 1400s BC, following the death of Thutmose II, she was determined on being portrayed as a male. The pharaoh, fake beard, the massive muscles, historians believe that this was all done as an act of politics. After her passing, come 1458 BC, her stepson took the throne, Thutmose III, and he destroyed everything in her name and image. Well, mostly everything. Now we have this bearded pharaoh that we're pretty sure we figured out. Number four, acne. Ancient Egyptians came up with uh, an interesting method on getting rid of those pimples, that's for sure. Remind you, this was long before Dr. Pimple Popper was ever a thing, so again, creative. Physicians back then discussed pimples as these elevated spots with black tops that can plague your skin from four to five years. And by squeezing these spots, you force out the maggot inside. Yeah, blackheads were called maggots back then. Imagine your partner, hey, can you get this pimple on my back? Yeah, I think I got some maggots in there. I don't know. I'd be sick. See ya. Now we're single. They would refer to severe cases of acne as maggots that lie in a bed of roses. Hey, if a physician ever told me I had maggots that lie in a bed of roses on my persons, I would faint. That's the scariest news. I've ever heard in my life. That's some bad news, man. Dermatological disorders were thought to be human skin taking on the properties of animals. Yeah. Oh, you have acne? Hmm. Are you sure you're not turning into a bird? Maybe it's that. Come back next week. Ancient Egyptians would use honey, vinegar, turpentine, and emulsion of bitter almonds, all to get rid of acne, hopefully. Sorry, maggots, not acne. Maggots. All to get rid of maggots. I'm gonna go throw up. Number three, prosthetics. The ancient Egyptians were a culture of firsts and some of their achievements we still have no idea how they were able to accomplish. Like like the pyramids? I couldn't tell you. Could you? Didn't think so. Hit that thumbs up. We're both wrong. We're both learning. It's very likely that some of the first ever prosthetics were used in ancient Egypt. How fascinating. Imagine being the first guy to make a toe, a fake toe. A female mummy who was discovered near Luxor had her death dated somewhere between 950 and 710 BCE. And she was also found with a prosthetic toe made from wood and leather on her persons. While this of course is a wonderful cosmetic replacement and it's no secret that the ancient Egyptians certainly valued aesthetics, it seems as though this prosthetic toe was completely functional and was actually used to help this woman walk. The toe, after it was discovered, had significant signs of wear and tear, which then inspired experts to start a study, look a little further. And they did. So they took participants and tested their gait, both with and without the use of a replicated toe. And in ancient Egypt, the common footwear were sandals, and walking in them would have been uh, next to impossible without a big toe. So it's clear that this prosthetic was very helpful and important to those similar to this Luxor mummy. Not exactly a beauty practice, but I'm sure they also felt a little 
more confident with that toe. This is also too impressive to exclude. Beauty list. I'm like, yeah, toes are beautiful. Why not? Throw them on. Number two, henna. I got henna done a few years ago and I totally blanked. I forgot that it lasted longer than like two days. I was like, day four, I'm like, what's going on, man? Is this permanent? Well, on one hand, pun intended, it is beautiful. Ancient Egyptians' use of henna went beyond style and beyond imaging oneself after the gods. See, henna also has cooling effects on the body and ancient Egypt was, uh, was quite hot. It was used by ancient Egyptians to color their hair and fingernails in shades of red and orange. Now this shade, this exact shade, also provided comfort on hot days. Come back with some henna. Kind of nice. It lasts longer than a few days though, just so you know, if you want to get henna. It's important to know. That guy did not tell me in Greece. No, he did not. And finally, number one, deodorant. When it comes to deodorant, today we listen to the Old Spice guy. He's always whistling about something new. But long before he was born, ancient Egyptians used ostrich eggs for deodorant. They made perfumes and oils, this is commonly known, but they were also the first to use any type of deodorant, like underarm deodorant. It was so impressive. Ostrich eggs mixed with a little fat and tamarisk and tortoise shell and then nuts. Mix them all together and bam, there you go. You're ready for date night. Just apply all of that on your body. Another method was a little more yummy than ostrich eggs and nuts. See, Egyptians would also use porridge balls. How creative is that? Flavored porridge rolled up and safely tucked in. And your underarm right there, right there on your little smelly chicken wing. This morning I had some deodorant just crumble apart when I was applying it. You ever have that happen? Turns to feta cheese all of a sudden, mid-application. Now my bathroom sink looks like a Greek salad. It smells great, but not practical. Might have to go back to the porridge ball method. Who knows? Maybe I have one right now. Maybe that's why I haven't moved this arm the whole time. Who knows? Those are the top 10 ancient Egyptian beauty practices that will freak you out if you want a part two. Well, it's my job. I'll come back and do it. Let's learn together, shall we? Kicking off our list at number 10, the Dendera light. Here we go. Going back to ancient aliens, maybe. Who knows? The Dendera light is a controversial image found in the temple of Hathor in Dendera, Egypt. Now, some theories suggest that this image here depicts an ancient Egyptian light bulb or some advanced advanced electrical technology of some sorts, which is pretty exciting. However, mainstream Egyptologists interpret it as a symbolic representation of religious concepts. That makes more sense than ancient Egyptian light brights, I guess. I guess, it's not as fun, but Sure, checks out. The bulb is more likely a depiction of the lotus flower and the central figure holding a snake is associated with the creation myths. So yeah, there's some history there. There's some tea behind, there's some stuff you have to know. The Dendera light is a subject of debate and speculation to this day, of course, because people want to believe that this is aliens, an alien light show. But there's currently no concrete evidence to support the claim that this represents ancient Egyptian knowledge of electricity or advanced lighting technology of sorts. Again, part of me wants to believe in ancient light bulbs, but maybe I've been playing too much Zelda. That's probably it. That's probably that, maybe. I don't know. Number nine, beer. Yeah, that's some pretty good stuff coming up next. Ancient Egyptians, they brewed and consumed beer on a daily basis. Now, they considered it a staple of their diet. Cool, me too, I guess. Beer production was primarily a household activity with everybody in the family helping the process, which is great. That's, what does your family taste like? Let's do it. The brewing techniques here involved fermenting grains, barley, and flavoring the beer with dates, honey, and spices. And pretty much anything you wanted. It's your brew. Get creative, throw, throw random shit in there. See how it tastes. Why not? It's ancient Egypt. Beer had both religious and social significance. Beer would be offered to deities and consumed during festivals and gatherings. Give a, a deity a Coors Light. You're like, here you go. This ought to cool you down. Rocky Mountain certified, buddy. Stop yelling, stop cursing our lands. It also provided hydration, nutrition, and a means of socializing in ancient Egyptian society. So hard to say no to that. Twist my arm, please. Number eight, curses. Of course, these are, these are real. These are very real. And you'll get cursed if you don't hit that thumbs up. Ancient Egyptian curses are a subject of fascination and speculation, of course. Curses were believed to be supernatural powers wielded by priests or individuals to protect sacred sites and or tombs from desecration. These curses often warned of dire consequences for anyone who disturbed the resting place of a pharaoh or violated these sacred spaces at all. The curses were typically inscribed on tomb walls or objects and invoked the wrath of gods and spirits. Ergo, don't touch my sh Thanks. Many inscriptions contain symbolic threats rather than the direct supernatural actions. So the curse of the pharaohs is mainly associated with King Tut. This curse gained attention when several individuals involved in the excavation of Tut's tomb just died unexpectedly. However, these deaths can be attributed to natural causes or coincidences, of course. But the timing here was a little, it's a little cursed. Nobody really knows, right? We want to believe. Maybe it's fun to believe. That way we won't steal things from the dead, right? Let's go that way. Number seven, a pet 
pet hippo. Are you a dog person? Are you a cat person? How about hippos? They're fun. They'll maybe eat you, who knows? Real quick, do you have any idea how fast hippos are? I had no clue my entire life. I thought they were fat and fun and stationary. No, hippos can run as fast as 50 kilometers an hour. Their bite is three times as powerful as the bite of a lion's. Yeah, so you shouldn't f with them. You shouldn't f with them with the pH. <laughs> the Pharaoh Menes was Egypt's first pharaoh. We refer to him as the lost pharaoh because, well, for starters, he was alive a very long time ago, 3000 BC, don't know much about him, but also he was killed by his pet hippo, therefore definitely lost. We lost him fast, fast and loud. This king spent over 60 years on the throne, and after all of that, all the wars and conquests and all the treaties, after all that, a hippo got him. What a shame. I mean, to be fair, I don't think there's a harder way to go out as a king. A hippo kills you? I don't know. That's pretty badass. That's like top three coolest ways to die next to like the Megalodon. I don't know. Number six, Israel Sphinx Claws. Ah, here we got some ancient Wolverine stuff coming in here. The mystery of the Sphinx Claws in Israel. This refers to a set of large limestone claws that were of course discovered near the city of Tel Hazor. Now these claws resemble feline paws of some sort. They're very sharp, very large, very intimidating, and they're believed to have once been part of a Sphinx sculpture. So someone just took a little bit home with them. That's always nice. The origin and purpose of these claws of course remain uncertain. Now some theories suggest that they were brought from Egypt or represent the influence of Egyptian culture in the region. One of the two. Someone stole it or someone was inspired. One of the two. Others propose alternative explanations such as symbolic or decorative elements. However, without further evidence or historical context, we don't really know because this was, I don't know, 3,000 years ago. Where do these hands come from? They're scary, but we'll never know. It is fascinating. I just wanted to show you these cool hands. Number five, the plow. Back in the day when we started to move away from the hunter gatherer lifestyle to more of a work the land and make a new farm lifestyle, Omari would go out into the field with his hoe and cultivate his land by hand. As you can imagine, this takes a hell of a long time, but we're a problem solving species. That's why we got to where we are now. And to the plow and the evolution of agriculture. So basically, you take your two favorite oxen and you connect them together and you connect them to a beam of wood that shoots out behind to the plow handle and to the blade of the plow that would go into the ground and be dragged behind by the ox, breaking up the ground. All the farmer has to do is sow the seed. This simple invention changed everything and it's still used in places where machinery is just unaffordable. Number four, the calendar. No one would blame you if in the last two years you forgot what day it was. I know after spending a lot of time inside, I forgot what day it was, but every day is a Saturday when you eat spicy chicken wings in your tidy whities Well, the Egyptians may have had one of the first calendars and a gosh darn good one too. Their calendar had 12 months and over 300 days. The trouble is after a while it kind of got a little inaccurate. They did their best to fix it. I mean, clearly if you look at the calendar, I mean, clearly it's the, it's the fifth of, uh, well, I think that looks like three men walking in sand. And next month we have a special festival happening. It looks like it'll be a sunny day on the 12th of uh, man with ball on, on his hat. Hi hieroglyphs are hard, man, I don't know. Number three, clocks. All right, so I'm not going to sit here and tell you the Egyptians invented the modern clock, no. But they did have to tell time. And as any dad or survival guru will tell you, the most reliable way to tell what time of the day it is would be that massive floating ball of plasma in the sky, the sun. Assuming it isn't a super cloudy day or anything. The obelisks we see in Egypt were not just fancy deco pieces. They were actually sun clocks, used to see how the sun would cast shadows throughout different times of the day. They even used it to figure out which days were longer and shorter. There was an even more interesting clock though, a water clock. It was basically a stone vessel with a tiny little hole at the bottom which allowed water to drip at a constant rate. The water marks spaced out at different levels would tell you how many hours had passed. This one's good because it worked at night and on cloudy days as well. Number two, mummification. Welcome back to the land of the living, my friend. You've been gone for quite some time. <laughs> oh. Yes, the process of mummification, probably the number one thing ancient Egypt is known for, maybe besides the pyramids. While not the only civilization of the past to practice this, they kind of ran the show here. Basically, the pharaoh's corpse has to stay fresh so their soul can make it into the afterlife. The heart stays, but everything else is like a furniture after a bad divorce. It must go. The brain was stirred up like a family reunion square dance and drained like last night's punch bowl. But wait, horror fans, there's more. Lungs, liver, bladder, intestines, stomach, kidney, and basically anything you can scoop out with your favorite ice cream scoop 
It was going. But don't toss them out though. Some of these organs were preserved in jars. Makes nice decorations beside the piles of gold found in the tombs. Yes, my liver jars. Oh, it is. Number one, cosmetic makeup. The ancient Egyptians created makeup as far back as 4000 BC. That's a long time ago. And that's how long we've been obsessed with our looks. Yikes. Their makeup actually served more of a purpose than just looking good though. The eye makeup they used specifically was believed to cure eye diseases, which wasn't true, and would protect them from the evil eye, which, I don't know, could have been true. Kind of like the ink, they would use soot, but they would combine it with a lead mineral called galena to create a black substance they called coal. That's K-H-O-L, not C-O-A-L. They had multiple colors, actually. They would make green makeup by combining malachite with galena. Now, if you saw our bizarre beauty products and history video, you probably know that lead, even lead minerals like galena, aren't really great for you. But hey, anything in the name of looking good. Number 10, punishment first. Innocent until proven guilty in a court of law, right? That's, that's how it goes. How do you know I drank the milk? <laughs> There's no milk on my face, how do you know? There'd probably be milk on my face. Not so much in ancient Egypt. While there is some evidence of jails existing, it is clear that they much preferred an immediate and swift justice. By that, I mean flogging, mutilation, removing limbs, uh, that sort of thing. A lot of these punishments were overseen by a vizier. In today's terms, it's sort of like a governor or official who had the power to oversee things like punishment through. Or at least held the most power besides the pharaoh, which, hey, that's a lot of power. While it may be an effective system for keeping prisons empty, no one should lose fingers for sliding a couple double bubbles in their pocket. That's just my opinion. Number 9. Prisoners While the promise of losing a limb, the second you're caught taking a cookie from the cookie jar, boy I've been there, is a great deterrent, prison can also work sometimes. It should be noted that Egypt developed a system of law and order 4,000 years ago, which is well, a long time ago and very impressive. For anyone taking the bar exam, that should be your answer under why take on law. Because the Egyptians did it first, why not? They do it, it's probably cool. So it makes sense that they did have some prisons. There's depictions of prisoners and drawings and figurines, surprisingly, oftentimes having their arms bound to their back like a good episode of Cops. And a leash around their neck with ropes and uh, well, it just looks a little strange and weird. Given that most criminals were done on the spot, it's not hard to imagine that the Egyptians were cruel to their prisoners, and they were, it was not good. They should be canceled, that's who should be canceled, them. Number eight, court. Believe it or not, they also had some sort of makeshift court as well. Who would have thought? No hammer and gavel, and certainly no Saul Goodman or Judge Judy, but hey, without those, I'd argue what the heck's the point of the American justice system in the first place, right? Ah, oh boy. But they were simple processes, to say the least. During the Middle Kingdom period, judges were appointed to decide on verdicts before well, it was usually priests, so I, I, I prefer a judge doing that, honestly. Except in this court, no one is legally represented by anyone. Yeah, that's right. There's no lawyers, but there was a jury and there were witnesses. Unfortunately, they were often beaten until, well, they said the truth or uh, the desired truth. Number seven, police. Bad boys, bad boys. What are you gonna do? Yes, that's right. Ancient Egypt may have had the first police force in history. Who would have thought? I actually didn't know that. I mean, sure, the vizier is great and all, but he can't possibly go around arresting everyone. He'd be at this all day. He can't do that. So it's only natural that you hire a bunch of dudes to do it for you. Can't get them all, but you can get some of them. While they did provide some limited support to communities and crime in towns, most of their arrests were made against those who were a little too greedy and thought grave robbing, well, the many sacred tombs around would make for an easy payday. It didn't. Number six, Bloodhounds and Baboons. That's a weird title. This one is so weird, but okay, here we go. We've all seen the movies where there's a crook, a perp, or someone who's trying to outrun the law. Andy Dufresne was right. You gotta crawl through a lot if you want your freedom. I remember Andy Dufresne. Anyway, well, in these scenes, there was a good chance that law enforcement has dogs with them. Oh, yeah, see, I'm getting somewhere with this. There's also a good chance that those dogs were bloodhounds. Cute dogs, actually, but the reason they bring them along is because they have a great nose. They can sniff a scent and follow it for miles, oftentimes leading to the crook. Smart dogs. What if I told you though that this sort of thing existed in ancient Egypt, except that it wasn't dogs, it was baboons. Yeah, who would have thought? 
Yes, that's right. There's depictions of police with baboons assisting in the work with crooks and or criminals. It's all jokes until Diddy Kong shows up to arrest you. Now it's DK time, baby. Uh-oh. Number five, the lost labyrinth. Archaeologists uncovered what's believed to be the remains of a long lost labyrinth below the sand of the Pyramid of Hawara, known as, quote, the labyrinth. Built by Amenhet III, it was the most visited sites of the ancient world. Greek Herodotus claimed to have counted 3,000 rooms in the pyramid's funeral complex during the 5th century BC. According to them, the underground temple consists of over 3,000 rooms filled with remarkable hieroglyphics and paintings. Close, too, located less than 100 kilometers from Cairo. In 2008, with the aid of ground penetrating technology, a Belgian Egyptian expedition was able to confirm the presence of an enormous underground temple. With no visible remains, the story was thought to be a legend passed down until Egyptologists uncovered its foundations in the 1800s. The results of this expedition indicate the presence of grid-like structures deep beneath the sand. Please tell me there's no minotaur just running around down there. Okay. Number four, the mystery queen. Archaeologists have unearthed a tomb of a previously unknown queen believed to have been the wife of Pharaoh Neferefra, who ruled 4,500 years ago. The tomb was discovered in Abu Sur, an old kingdom necropolis southwest of Cairo, where there are several pyramids dedicated to the pharaohs of the fifth dynasty. The name of his wife had not been known until recently. She was Kenta Kaz, renowned as the mother of two Egyptian pharaohs. Kenta Kaz I is a mysterious woman who ruled in the fourth dynasty dynasty and has archaeologists puzzled at her burial complex in Giza. Though rough evidence for ancient Egyptian queens, the remains of this female leader were undisturbed for two millennia within the necropolis until its excavation in the late 1930s. Hieroglyphic inscriptions concerning her title had been discovered and subsequently became open for interpretation. Her title was initially regarded to be, quote, King of Upper and Lower Egypt and, quote, Mother of King of Upper and Lower Egypt. So who was this mysterious, powerful figure in ancient Egypt? Who was she? Number three. The Dendera Lights. All these tombs and underground chambers, how the hell did they see anything under there? Well, we really don't know, but we have some sort of direction. These ancient battery looking light bulbish things could have maybe been the power source. Ancient Egypt seems to be full of keyholes, drill holes, and shafts that are literally impossible without high powered tools. Most people say aliens, me included, but I also say, the Dendera light bulbs. They've been theorized as being some sort of battery. The Hothor Temple at Dendera contains several relief depictions, Harsimtus in the form of a snake, emerging from a lotus flower. The Dendera light is a variation of this mode of showing Harsimtus in an oval container, a snake inside, taking a number of humans to lift, and it holds apparent meanings of the start of creation. Look, I don't care what you say, this thing is a light bulb. It's got a filament. And coils? Come on, drill holes? They couldn't have just lit fires underground, the smoke, the heat, I don't think so. Now a couple of DeWalts, just sanding up the pyramids real nice, you know? Who knows? Who knows? Number two, the city of Punt. The land of Punt or the ancient city of Punt was an ancient kingdom sometime back then. A trading partner of ancient Egypt, it was known for producing and exporting gold, aromatic resins, precious stones, black wood, ivory, you name it. The region is known from ancient Egyptian records of trade expeditions. At time, Punt is referred to as the land of God. No pressure, archaeologists. The exact location of Punt is debated and unknown by historians. Q Indiana Jones movie. Various locations have been offered southeast of Egypt, a Red Sea coastal region, Somalia, Ethiopia, Sudan, no one really knows. First deciphered in Egyptian hieroglyphics in 1822, scholars began reading Egyptian texts and the mystery got mystery -er. That's not a word. More questions arose as to where Punt was located and what happened to it. The land of Punt is written by voyagers as being praised for its lavish riches and goodness of land. Okay, so it exists somewhere. This is awesome, isn't it? Wouldn't it suck if we already found everything? We're going on an expedition, boy. Grab your thing, let's go. And coming in at the number one spot, the Sphinx. Where do I even start? Known as the oldest carved rock like ever, its age is debated literally every day due to the questions it asks scholars. Was it wind erosion, water erosion? How many times was this thing broken and rebuilt? The Great Sphinx of Giza, the limestone statue of a reclining sphinx, a mythical creature with a head of a human and the body of a lion. Facing directly west to east, it stands on the Giza Plateau on the west bank of the Nile. The face of the sphinx appears to represent the pharaoh Khafre, although this is heavily debated as wrong gears and looking nothing like him. It's since been restored with tons of layers of limestone blocks, 
Although still unfixed, its nose was broken off for unknown reasons between the 3rd and 10th century. Maybe some artillery fire over the years? Who knows? The Sphinx is the oldest known sculpture in Egypt, and archaeologists suggest that it was created in the Old Kingdom using unknown construction methods. Yeah, definitely that battery thing. From 1817 to 1930, this thing was buried up to its neck and written and drawn about for centuries. I wonder what other secrets lay under her right now. I guess we'll eventually find out someday. I wonder what else is just waiting to be dug up, you know? Imagine they find a cell phone. Kicking off our list at number 10, Ancient Egyptian Eyeliner. Whenever you see hieroglyphics or any art depicting the great pharaohs, they're usually rocking some impressive eyeliner. They look great, right? Like a 90s pop star, they look awesome. Ancient Egyptians were the OG eyeliner users. They made their own eyeliner from lead salts. And no, before you think about getting creative, do not try this at home. This wasn't an ideal process. See, for starters, these salts were quite high in lead concentration. So, in order to avoid that mess, Ancient Egyptians first First had to process and then filter that lead salt for up to 30 days in order to get the lead levels low enough to even be applied. So you had to plan accordingly. You're like, oh, I have a pharaoh date in 30 days? Perfect. We'll start now. It was a hazard if done incorrectly. Not only was this ancient beauty practice, well, beautiful to look at, but Egyptians also needed eyeliner to protect against sun damage as well as fight off any infections. Yeah, we don't encourage rubbing lead on your eyes today. We have a few different methods on, you know, how to look good. I think. None of them include lead, hopefully, ideally. Number nine, hair gel. Back in my day, in high school, I had to use dippity do Extra Hold Hair Gel. Yeah, I showed a scale on the side, I always got the five out of six hold, that was good. Six was too much, nobody ever did the full six, that's crazy talk. But in ancient Egypt, we didn't have styling spiking glue and blasting free spray by DJ Polly D. No, we have that today, unfortunately, but back then, a little different. Back then, ancient Egyptians loved styling their hair, but again, before DJ Polly D was born, what is a pharaoh to do? If the Great Pyramids are any indication, they knew something that we didn't. Ancient Egyptians knew how to keep their hair in one place all day long. And that heat too, how do you do it? My curls? I'm jealous. Their hair styling gel was made with shea butter and coconut oil. But more often than not, they would replace coconut oil with almond oil. So this was a completely natural and strengthening styling gel. Cut to today, we have whatever that is. Psst, ice spray, that's awesome. DJ Polly. psst. No. Number eight, coffee scrub. I love coffee. I don't think I love coffee enough to do a coffee face scrub, but hey, never say never. I'll try anything once. Ancient Egyptians would use coffee scrub to reduce inflammation, improve blood circulation, and since it's a ground up material, it's gonna remove those dead skin cells at the same time. Next holiday season, grab your aunt some coffee scrub. Just tell her how it reduces puffiness, improves the skin's texture, all that good stuff. It'll give you that youthful feral look that you've been going for, you know what I mean? Merry Christmas, here you go, coffee on your face. Using grounded coffee powder to exfoliate your skin sounds like a new idea. It's certainly a hot trend today. But before TikTok, ancient Egyptians already knew these benefits. Damn, I'm gonna get a coffee scrub. Maybe I'll do it, I don't know. After I'm done this cup, I'll just rub it on my face, on my desk, and see what uh, everyone says. Number seven, dead sea salt. You'll never feel more alive than when you use dead sea salt. Here we go. Ancient Egyptians were ahead of the exfoliation game. Dare I say, they invented it. Not only were coffee scrubs a necessity, but salt from the Dead Sea was one of the most popular popular ancient Egyptian skincare products ever. We traveled far and wide for this one. Salt collected from the Dead Sea was used to exfoliate dead skin cells, and it was so well known at this point that, rumor has it, Cleopatra herself would travel all the way to the Dead Sea from Egypt just to take a bath. Yeah, let's be honest, after this point, we'd all love a rejuvenating Dead Sea float. That sounds way better than what I've got at home. Well, bathtub, I can't even fit in this thing. Dead Sea sounds way better. I once left a house party earlier to go have a bath. Swear to God, York University. Dipped at like 10 o'clock. I was like, I'm cold, I'm not doing this. 40 minute walk, worth it. Leave your friends for a bath, do it. Number six, wax cones. Head cones, also known as perfume cones, were used in ancient Egypt. You've probably seen them in a thumbnail here at some point. The art depicting head cones is quite unique looking. It's like a pharaoh with a triangle on their head. You're like, what's happening there? What is this? Was like Illuminati? What is this? Long before Pantene Pro-V, when it came to head cleanliness, these triangular wax cones were here to save the day. And they looked pretty fun to use. I don't know. They would just sit on top of your head. You didn't need to mix anything with lead for 30 days or brain or anything like that. You don't need to put any organs in jars, just a wax cone atop of your head. Easy. Back in 2019, experts found archaeological evidence that they were in fact used. So yeah, not just a glyph. 
real life history. So I have to bring this up. Men and women alike would wear this cone and your body heat would slowly melt the wax cone down and through your hair. The cone itself was made of oils, fat, resin. It would be placed on their wig or directly onto your head and it would keep melting and refreshing all day long. It's like a little candle almost. A nice little human candle. A nice little Egyptian man candle. As fascinating as ancient Egyptian culture is, I don't think anybody misses wax cones. It's a little easier nowadays. I'm too tall too. I can't have a wax cone. Are you kidding me? It would hit this mic. No way. Number five, bug repellent. I don't know about you guys, but sometimes when I smell certain things, it reminds me of stuff. I'm like that rat in Ratatouille. Just, oh, I love fr France. It smells like France in there. I don't know. <laughs> Don't smell your own farts, Chief, I don't know. As summer is just about to begin for me, it's sunscreen, beer, and of course, bug repellent. I don't know exactly what's in the bug repellent, but I know it doesn't work very well, and I know it smells like it's shaving minutes off my life. Ooh, not good. Well, ancient Egyptians had their own version of bug repellent. When the pharaohs and royals wished to enjoy a picnic outside in the beautiful sun, oftentimes there would be bugs. So to prevent this, they found the next closest servant and slathered them in honey, lots of honey. Ooh, too much, and then place them a safe distance away from said picnic. Do this a few times and you got yourself a bona fide fly trap. Now you can enjoy your picnic in peace. You know, just ignore the servants screaming because they're being eaten alive by flies and all kinds of bugs. Ooh, kind of gross. Number four, mouse toothpaste. A lot of things I can understand. There, there's a point to it all. It adds up. Checks out. The mouse toothpaste does not check out or add up. I talked to the chief and he said that's not it. Yes, the ancient Egyptians knew that dental hygiene was very important, as it is. Go brush your teeth. They knew brushing their teeth was important as, well, yeah, as it is. And it should be noted that they may have invented the toothbrush. Hmm, pretty cool. However, it is in my humble opinion that they missed the mark on the toothpaste. There's no Colgate around. Basically, you take a cute little mouse and you crush it up until it's just a paste or essence of a mouse, as they call it. Then to combat what I'm sure was a horrific scent, herbs and spices were added, oftentimes mint, for that minty fresh breath that everyone so needs. Disgusting, no thank you, I'll pass. Number three, mummies. Yes, we all know the ancient Egyptians had mummies. Pharaohs and kings wrapped up like a good Christmas gift in preparation for the afterlife. You may have heard some things about it, and I'm here to tell you all the awful stomach churning things you've heard. They're true. That's right. In particular, the removal of the brain. While the ancient Egyptians were incredibly smart and talented, the process for removing the brain had the same finesse your grandpa had trying to get ketchup out of a glass bottle. I'll get it eventually. Yep, it's coming. <laughs> I'll get it. A long iron stick was used to be inserted into the nose until it reached your brain, right past the fifth grade memories. The next step was to stir vigorously until you could lay the person on their stomach and the brain came out in what was probably the most offensive pink slurry I've ever had the displeasure to think of. Disgusting. Disgusting? I can't believe you done that. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna be sick. Number two, makeup. Surprise, surprise. The ancient Egyptians came up with another invention, makeup. The billion dollar industry that isn't going anywhere. You might be surprised to know that both men and women wore makeup back then. Although today that's the that's case too. And a, a, as an actor, I've worn makeup a lot. It's really not that big of a deal, really. What is a big deal, however, is how they made it. If you've ever seen any images of Egyptians, then you know how blue and green eyeliner is a must have. Well, the main ingredient in that eyeliner isn't paint, folks. It's beetles and bugs. Gross. Colorful bugs were crushed up and added to make compounds in order to achieve the Egyptian look. Number one, shepherd of the anus. Like I said before, the Egyptians contributed greatly to art, medicine, engineering. They were smart. But for the last point today, we're gonna focus on medicine and more specifically, the doctors who were most likely the first proctologists. Way to go, Egypt. The Egyptian for these behind doctors literally traits to shepherd of the anus. They would administer medicine and of course, the always famous and pleasurable enemas. They loved enemas in ancient Egypt, who would've thought? They thought, they thought it was a gift from the gods, crazy. Number 10, bowling. Where would we be as a species if we didn't spend the entirety of the 1990s in bowling alleys and in arcades? In later years, they seem to have fallen out of style, and for the life of me, I can't figure out why. 
Where else for $20 a person can you spend time in a large building with the heat on? And the youngest people besides you and your friends is a league of retiree bowlers saying questionable things in the lane beside you. A blue carpet with planets and rocket ships has the same amount of character as the musty clown shoes you wear as you approach the snack stand. A waff of radioactive nacho cheese assaults your nose as the bubblegum chewing student behind the counter asks if you want another room temperature domestic beer. <laughs> nice. The foam and bacteria forming in your stomach is a classic tale of a bowling alley tucked away in a Midwest snow covered state. <laughs> nice. Now with my colorful depiction aside, let's get to the history. None of that glory would be possible without the Egyptians. Yes, they invented bowling. No nacho cheese and weird animations on the TV, but it was still bowling. The ball was made of rope and leather, or sometimes rock, as were the pins. Throw it at the pins. Simple. That's it. That's bowling. Number nine, math. Oh, math. You remind me of a simpler time. A time when I was bawling my eyes out while my dad asked me over and over again, what is nine times three? Expecting me to come up with the answer under the enormous weight of patriarchal pressure. 27, dad, it's 27. While the ancient Greeks usually get credit for coming up with mathematics, they actually took it from the Egyptians across the Mediterranean. And then yes, they improved upon it. The Egyptians used a numeral system that helped them solve equations involving multiplication and the absolutely disgusting fractions. These guys understood concepts such as geometry and algebra, and they were the first civilization to develop and solve second degree quadratic equations. I don't even know what that means. I wonder if there was ever a little ancient Egyptian boy who got yelled at at the ancient dinner table by his ancient father about finding the circumference of a circle in the middle of the night. Probably. Number eight, papyrus. I heard Egyptians like paper. Well, you're gonna be doing a lot of paper rolling when you're living in a van down by the river. Huh, strange. I, I think I've heard that somewhere before. Yes, the Egyptians gave the world papyrus, which eventually would become paper. Writing stuff down before this was very difficult. It was inscribed in clay or stone tablets. That's hard. How is a stenographer supposed to do their job? Or when you get mad at an office printer for not working? You can't just break the tablet. We've all been there before, and if I were to make a list of the most important inventions of all time, paper would be on that list. Number seven, black ink. So you make papyrus paper, but what the heck are you gonna use to write on it? Ink, you're gonna use ink, obviously. That's right, the ancient Egyptians actually invented ink. Now, they weren't the only ones, the Chinese also invented ink around the same time as well. But this video ain't about them. The ink used by the Egyptians was made from soot and ash from burning wood or oil mixed with water. Some of their inks even contained lead that would help ancient Egyptians bind the ink to the paper. But they didn't just use black. They had red inks made from iron based compounds as well as blue, green, white and yellow. It was a colorful place and they were likely a colorful people. Number six, the haircut. A little off the top, Ramses. Honestly, it's time for me to get a haircut too. Is there any mommy out there willing to cut a blue eyed boy's hair? I wish. I could go for some home cooking too. Anyway, I digress. Yes, the Egyptians very well may have invented the haircut or at least regular grooming practices. Having long hair just wasn't in their culture and honestly, in the hot sun and sands of Egypt, can you blame them? I don't think so. When I was younger, I used to have my head shaved. I thought it looked good. Eh, it kinda did, but the main reason I did it was because it kept me cool, it was functional. It may surprise you that yes, we got hot summers in Canada. So I can understand why the Egyptians did that. That being said, they did manage to keep some of their facial hair because beards are like makeup for men, we just look better with them, we look, we look good. It's a good look. And speaking of, after that unification happened, it paved the way for the royal trendsetter Narmer. Because before our boy Narmer came along, the red crown of Lower Egypt and the white crown of Upper Egypt were worn by the pre-dynastic kings. Narmer was famously the first king to be portrayed wearing both crowns symbolizing that union. This would later be replaced with the striped crown, a continuous representation of union called a nemesis. Adorning the top was the uraeus, an upright cobra that symbolized the ancient Egyptian goddess Wajet, meaning the pharaoh is ready to strike his enemies with deadly venom. Trendsetter Narmer doesn't stop at crowns, he's the first ruler to portray themselves in a royal beard, which every Egyptian pharaoh wore afterwards, whether man or woman. Then there's Narmer's implementation of an official who has the most important task of carrying the pharaoh's magic sandals. Egyptian pharaoh's sandals were the only piece of clothing that separated them from the land of Egypt and rightfully symbolized the union between the heavenly god world and the earthly human world. King Tut's sandals were famously inscribed with pictures of his enemies, meaning with every step 
Egypt, he was crushing the enemies of Egypt. In the famous Narmer palette, he's also seen wearing a fake bull tail, which symbolized strength to rule the country of the Nile, but that trend didn't stick. Hey, so Ramses has 50 lost daughters. What a crappy dad, doesn't know where all his kids even are. Kinda understandable when you have 102 of them, with about 9 women, however. Made possible by somehow living to be 91 in an age where people died at like 20. Suffice to say, he had lots of leisure time. Of course, not all the children were children at the same time. Ramses II began his family long before he took over as king, and he reigned for 66 years. He spread the brood out over most of that time. So archaeologists announced in 1820 they uncovered a tomb built by Ramses, and that 52 or so of his sons happened to be in it. They finally recently started excavations after a few decades, and now we know that the mausoleum is the largest and most complex found to date in Egypt's Valley of the Kings, with at least 62 rooms. But Egyptian kings normally didn't build mausoleums for their offsprings. Their principal wives, yes, over in the Valley of Queens, but their kids, no. If it turns out the only Ramesses' sons are in the tomb, where are the 50 daughters? Sexism can answer that. Males were regarded as potential heirs to the throne, and the princesses were not, so they weren't held in high esteem and didn't get a fancy resting place. Doesn't mean they didn't have value, Ramesses designated at least three of his daughters as princess queens. Woo! No? No? Oh, no. What that suggests isn't pretty. But what isn't known is whether or not they were actually married to him and, you know, producing, or if the title was a way of honoring selected daughters from tertiary wives. Historians, however, are pretty confident on which one it is. This would be the end of the story, but for a single question. Why would a latex protection manufacturer name its product for a man who had 102 kids? Are you choosing cats or your empire? In Egypt, the penalty for killing a cat was death. This it wasn't just a law against cruelty to animals or sadistic Friday the 13th butchery. All you had to do was accidentally run over a cat with your chariot and you're done. This is mostly due to the animal being closely linked with the cat-headed goddess of warfare and balls of twine, Bastet. They were also revered for the role they played in protecting food stores and homes from disease by killing pests like snakes and rats. Basically, pharaohs coined the three laws of robotics a millennia before Asimov and used them to protect the thing that poops under the stairs. And I, I don't think there are exceptions. One writer did Doris Siculus even recorded that the king of Egypt himself personally tried to intervene and save a Roman man who had accidentally killed a cat. His people did not give a single F, however, ignored the ruler, showed no mercy, caring literally negative a thousand if it meant risking war with Rome. They formed a mob, hung him, and left his body in the streets while the pharaoh sent a real awkward fruit basket apology to Rome. Perhaps the greatest example of a pharaoh placing the well-being of cats above that of his own people, however, was Pharaoh Pismatic III literally told his army not to fight the Persians' advancement because these smart little twists had painted the image of Bastet on their shields and marched behind a line of dogs, sheep, and cats. In their words, whatever animals the Egyptians hold dear. The Egyptians, under threat of death from the pharaoh, had no choice but to let the Persian ruler walk straight into the city unchecked. He then murked anyone who dared to challenge him, using the shields with cats drawn on them because you can't even strike an image of a cat in ancient Egypt. Cambyses, the ruler's name, celebrated in a dignified noble fashion, marching the Egyptian armies past him as he threw cats at them and screamed in insults at their gods. We aren't 100% sure who the first pharaoh was, but it was probably Catfish Chisel. The only way we know the lineage for early Egyptian kinship is the highly damaged Palermo Stone, which was a black slab of granite carved full of the names of kings up to the 5th dynasty. The part of the stone where the first and second king of the 1st dynasty is inscribed is butts to clean off. Although it is generally accepted that the first king was Narmer, aka Menes. The second one was Aha. Even without enough evidence to prove beyond a doubt, I can't get past the Aha. Thing. The name of Narmer is composed to two ideograms, the catfish reading as Nar and the chisel reading as Mer. The location of Narmer's body has eluded archaeologists for two centuries now. The first Egyptian pharaohs used to build a type of tomb called a Mabasta, and they did so until the third dynasty when they started busting out pyramids. It's theorized Narmer is in one of those. But then Egyptologists have discovered a large field of pre-dynastic and early dynastic royal tombs in Umakab, and the Narmer's name is identified in an inscription found. However, this is Egypt. The site had suffered disturbances, tomb robbing, and disrest for the past 5,000 years, making it impossible to know which one of the bodies is the precise tomb of Narmer. To this day, archaeologists and Egyptologists disagree on whether Narmer was buried at Saqqara or Umm el Khab, and in the end, his cause of death isn't even fully known. Just that of a philosopher in Mantheo saying the reign of Narmer ends when he was carried off by a hippopotamus and perished. And last but not least, 
believe my eyes, even though it may be a lie. Who knows, I don't, but I love a good rhyme. While it was likely a disease genetically inherited in his DNA, the official Egyptian story is that Pharaohs was cursed by the gods with blindness. Apparently, when the Nile was flooding, Pharaohs got fed up with it, and instead of letting the water do its thing and calm down, he chucked a spear at it. Because yes, throwing a spear at a river would probably change things. For his insolence and stupidity, the gods struck his ass Pharaoh's vibes this way the best he can for 10 years before he meets an oracle that either wanted to pull history's most hilariously mean prank or genuinely believed the gods had passed on this message. But the oracle tells Pharaoh's all he's got to do is wash his eyes with the urine of a woman who's never slept with any other person than her husband her whole life. Okay. Well, Pharaoh's isn't asking questions, he's here for solutions. He finds his wife and says, babe, I want to spice things up in the bedroom, I have an idea. And the two of them give it a try. Only it doesn't work. So now he's still blind, and his wife has some explaining to do. Before she does that though, Pharaoh's needs some more urine and he needed it now. So every woman in town is gathered up and given a pot, which he then sat there dumping its contents into his eyes, one after each other. No, I don't know if he waited for it to cool down. I do know it was probably the color of French's mustard though, seeing as Egyptians literally only drank warm beer. So imagine. But somehow Pharaoh's finds the one who's not cheating on her husband or hadn't banged someone before getting married, and one of these warm beer pee buckets works. And I wish I was kidding, but the official Egyptian records say, yeah, magic pees did this. His sight is back, and he asks for the hand of the magic pee wielding woman so they can marry on the spot. All the while, her husband awkwardly watches the consequences of his wife not cheating on him unfold. Oh, and then Pharaoh's burned his old wife to death. Or at least that's how the legend goes. I highly doubt that it really did restore his eyesight, and maybe he just ordered historians to write a good story to explain a weird habit. You know, <laughs> fetish. We got a <laughs> fetish here. <laughs> Sammy Lacker, Pharaoh's fetish. Number 10 construction. We can't talk about ancient Egypt and the mysteries still unsolved there if we don't start on how the hell these things were built. And also, it's not just like three pyramids. There's 118 of these things. When did they have time to construct all of these? Ropes? Pulley systems? Yeah, I'm not convinced. Ramps? Ramps. Ramps would have been a mile long against the pyramid's height. That's like hundreds of years right there. You ever dug a hole in your backyard? Two feet, it's like six hours right there, and a sore back. Some have theorized a water hydraulic system was used to transport the carved rocks up slopes and tubes with tidal power. Okay, better, better. But like, how did they line up the rocks so perfectly and so square at the top? One inch off and every carpenter knows that's gonna shift everything. Also, the alignment to true north, the odd coincidences with the dimensions resembling the cosmos, they couldn't have known back then, you know? Buckle up, it's only gonna get weirder. Number nine, Chamber of Secrets. In 2017, scientists were able to peek inside the Great Pyramid finally using modern day physics. Particles, actually. What they found revealed numerous hidden secret chambers and rooms that were thought to never exist. The most bizarre discoveries was a massive unknown void nearly 100 feet long that lays just above the pyramid's grand gallery. Khufu, also known as the Great Pyramid, was received the most attention due to its size and age, but it wasn't the only chamber they found. No, gold, mummies, manuscripts, ancient technology. What lies inside these voids? Also, how the hell did they floor and roof a room that's inaccessible? How do you build that inside such a small chamber already? Muon tomography uses cosmic rays of muons and generates a 3D image through nearly any material. This technology is groundbreaking, literally. Uh, here we go. Yep, found it, there it is. Number eight, the Saqqara Temple. The Pyramid of Djoser, also known as the Step Pyramid, is an archeological site in the Saqqara Necropolis. The discovery of a 4,400 year old tomb now seen as UNESCO's World Heritage Site is the six tier four sided structure, which very well may be the earliest colossal stone structure in Egypt and possibly the world. Stone mounds were made in Europe for millennia, but it was the pyramid shape that started here. It was built 27th century BC during the third dynasty for the Pharaoh Djoser. The pyramid is the center of a huge complex and an enormous courtyard surrounded by ceremonial structures and decorations. Its architect was created from the Egyptian architect himself, Imhotep, the high priest of the god Ra. This guy was like the building manager, you know? The head architect. In fact, wasn't even found or really even studied till about the 1920s and was recently excavated in 2018. The pyramid went through several revisions over the years and in March 2020, the pyramid was officially reopened for visitors after a 14 year fix up. Check out Netflix, they do a great documentary on this. Number seven, Queen Nefertiti, the queen of the 18th dynasty of ancient Egypt, the beloved royal wife of Pharaoh Akhenaten. Nefertiti and her husband were known for a religious revolution in which they worshipped solely the sun disk Aten as their one and only god. Oh, 
blasphemy. She reigned during what was arguably the wealthiest and most lavish period of, of ancient Egypt. Here's the weird part. We don't know where she is. Usually kings and queens are buried in very spiritual, very high ranked places like the royal tomb. Easy to find. But nope, no one can find her or even know what happened to her. In 2015, archaeologists thought with high resolution scans, voids that are behind the walls of Tutankhamun's tomb proposed maybe that she was there. Nope, no Nefertiti. In 2003, archaeologists thought through the hair DNA, Nefertiti's mummy may have been quote, the younger lady. Nope. Turns out it was just Tutankhamun's mom. So what exactly happened to this famously revered queen? Who knows? Aliens, dude. When in doubt, always aliens. You know what I mean? Number six, King Tut's death. When archaeologists opened a sarcophagus in Egypt's Valley of the Kings for the first time in 1923, it was the discovery of a lifetime. The ancient Egyptian boy king, King Tutankhamun, the burial chamber of the 19-year-old who ruled 3,300 years ago. But why did he die so young? DNA tests and CT scans show he suffered from malaria, a broken leg, and congenital deformities associated with inbreeding, common amongst royalty. Ouch. Because of his tomb's extremely small size, historians think King Tut's death must have been unexpected and his burial rushed by A, who succeeded him as a pharaoh. The tomb's chambers were packed to the brim with more than 5,000 artifacts, including furniture, chariots, clothes, weapons, and 130 of the king's walking sticks. A 24 pound solid gold mask was placed over him and he was laid in a series of containers, three golden coffins and a granite sarcophagus. His death still has scientists scratching their heads. Also, look up how many archeologists died months after the cursed tomb had been raided. Yeah, you don't wanna know. Number five, Xerxes the First. You've most likely heard of this guy. If not from his historically inaccurate portrayal in 300, then at least from one or two history classes. But Adam, wasn't he the emperor of Persia? Yeah, well guess what my little bees? Egypt was part of the Persian Empire, which makes him pharaoh as well. This guy gets a pretty bad rap in history. But who wrote that history? the Greeks who despised him for his attempted invasion of Greece. Oh, I'm not saying he was great or anything. In fact, he had a bit of a disregard for the traditions of the Egyptians and their way of life. But you cannot tell me that he was not significant in history. Xerxes the Great makes this list for his infamy more than anything else. Number four, Akhenaten. So this is gonna be the second not so beloved pharaoh on this list. But disdain for Akhenaten didn't come from war or the fact that his massive army was defeated by a group of a couple hundred Greeks. No, Akhenaten here was infamous for his devout following of a singular god, Aten, the god of the sun. He actually moved the capital of Egypt to a new location that he titled Akhetaten, or Horizon of Aten. And he kinda made everyone else worship the single god Aten as well. He was famous for a different reason though. Akhenaten was married to Nefertiti. She played a huge part in his religious plans and she is well known in history for the limestone bust that was made of her and has been copied so many freaking times. Number three, Khufu. When you think of Egypt, there is likely one thing that pops straight into your mind. If you say anything other than the Great Pyramids of Giza, you do not pass go, you do not collect $200 and you lose. Khufu is the pharaoh you have to thank for this wonder of the ancient world. We still sorta of don't know exactly how it was constructed, but this goliath limestone and mud brick structure was the tallest building in the world for like 4,000 years. It was built as the housing for his tomb and as his stairway to heaven. No, not the Led Zeppelin song. It has three chambers inside of it plus a gallery that we've discovered so far. As for what else Khufu contributed to ancient Egyptian life, we don't have much in the way of texts about that yet. But if this is the main thing, then I mean, I'd take it. Number two, Cleopatra. How could she not be on this list? She was the very last pharaoh Egypt ever had, and she was arguably one of the most famous ones. Not only becoming a figure in history, but a character in literature, theater, and media. Cleopatra VII was pharaoh in Egypt from 51 to 30 BC, and it was one hell of a reign. She introduced tons of reforms to improve the Egyptian economy. She was an awesome diplomat and a scholar. She didn't have things too easy though. Having to fight her own brother for the throne and having to do some diplomacy with various famous Romans. Things kind of fizzled out near the end, but she certainly ended the line of Egyptian pharaohs with a beloved bang, as was her style. Number one, Ramses II. All right, 
This one was definitely the one I thought of first. Ramses II is arguably the most famous of all the pharaohs. He reigned for 67 years. He had 96 children. He had a crazy successful military campaign conquering the Hittites, Syrians and Nubians. No other pharaoh that we know of has been able to build like he has. He lived to the age of 90, which is insane for back then. And he professed himself a god, which I'm sure some people actually believed. Even today, when we moved his remains to France for restoration, he had to be given a passport that literally said, King, deceased, under the occupation. Truly an incredibly influential pharaoh. Number 10 is the Pet Patrol. Do you guys remember the scene in Disney's Aladdin where he steals a piece of fruit and miraculously evades capture? Well, in real ancient Egypt, our prince wouldn't have stood a chance as police in Egypt used baboons to catch thieves. Incredibly intelligent, these animals were able to be trained, which paired with their speed and ability to jump to places that are difficult for humans to reach, made them the perfect crime fighters. Baboons could also easily remember the face of any thief as they are ranked third in the animal world for their memory. So don't go relying on any luck to get away with anything. Outside of their police duties, they were treated incredibly kindly, but trained to participate in picking fruit, making beer, and even dancing. Baboons were so beloved by Egyptians that some mummies were later found to have tattoos of baboons on their bodies. In ancient Egyptian mythology, baboons are best known for their association with Hoth, the god of wisdom. However, they were linked to many other gods as well. Definitely nothing like Babu in Atlantis. Aladdin. But wait, did I say tattoo? Well, being inked up is no modern phenomena. Number nine is tatted up tuts. Egyptians join indigenous, Nordic, African, and many other cultures of having a history of tattooing. Now, Egyptian tattooing was bizarre just because it was exclusive to only women. By tattooing in public regions of the body, the tattoos were intended to permanently mark the woman's association with religious worship, or on the flip side, they could also be used to symbolize the lower class and the mark of a dancing girl or a to. That's what also makes it so bizarre. We can't really figure out why it was only women, what they meant, or what they symbolized beyond the vague generalization I just gave you. Tattooed mummies dating back to the 11th century dynasty have been found by archaeologists, some with religious symbolism, other with dots and swirls located on the lower chest, the abdominal, and the thighs. Some mummies were believed to have been tattooed with medical symbols, potentially to treat ailments. Although the meaning of ancient ta Egyptian tattoos may be unclear, it seems evident that they had an array of implications and that women of many different social classes chose to wear the baddies. Speaking of things we can't understand, number eight in our countdown is my favorite pun yet. I put that on everything. Except quite literally. Egyptian doctors used human and animal excrement as a cure-all remedy for diseases and injuries. According to Eber's papyrus recording in 1500 BC, animal feces such as donkey, dog, gazelle, and fly were all celebrated for their healing properties and considered to ward off bad spirits. While we know that Egyptian medicine was incredibly advanced, even having doctors who were specialists, you can't help but question this logic. However, like with most things the Egyptians did, technically they weren't wrong. Research shows that microflora found in some types of animal dung contain antibiotic substances. So sure, you risk some tetanus, but you could also be cured. Lizard blood, dead mice, mud, moldy bread were also all used as topical ointments and dressings, and women were also sometimes dosed with horse saliva as a cure for low libido. And speaking of a woman's libido, man, did the Egyptians have some crazy women's healthcare going on. Number seven, we'll call the fertility games. I have a new family found appreciation for modern medicine after learning a way our ancient Egyptian friends tested fertility was by placing a garlic or onion clove inside of a woman's. This is because ancient Egyptians believed that all orifices of a woman were connected, kind of like subway tunnels. Anyways, if the doctor could smell garlic on your breath the next morning, then the tubes were clear and the woman was fertile. But if the doctor couldn't smell garlic, then the tubes were blocked and it was assumed that the woman couldn't give birth. Once you are pregnant though, you can find out the sex of your baby in another bizarre tradition, popping a squat over some barley. Why? Because if it barely grew, then the baby was a boy. If the barley grew like crazy, then the baby was a girl. This test was believed to be highly accurate, and they weren't wrong in that. Turns out the test was actually accurate in 70% of all cases, and in 1963 lab testing, the urine of a pregnant woman did cause the seeds to sprout. Since she was in fact pregnant with a girl, it's likely the seeds start to grow faster due to elevated levels of estrogen, which stimulates growth. I can think of some true 
truly hilarious ways to integrate this into a gender reveal party. But kids aren't for everyone, and that's okay. Ancient Egyptians were notoriously not fans of them, so let's talk number six, safe sex. There are actually lots of stories of Egyptian contraceptive methods, but don't get too fascinated because these aren't anything you want to try and recreate. Egyptian women would collect the dung of crocodiles or elephants to mix with sacred herbs and honey. They would then apply this paste mixture to their vulva and up inside the vagina as a protective seal on their genitals. Okay, men, don't think you're getting much better though as your contraceptive was to rub onion juice all over your junk. If neither of these worked, which shocker if they didn't, the Egyptians had an herb called silphium, which was used to help devoid a woman of an unwanted pregnancy. They even knew what has been confirmed today that a chia gum from an achia tree worked as a spermicide and would reduce the likelihood of pregnancy after the fact. While it's impressive they figured out what they did, this whole section just has yeast infection written all over it, so let's just keep going for everybody's sake. I mentioned telling y'all about another keeper of the secret, so that's exactly what number five will be. This impressive tomb complex belonged to Kedis a priest and official who was once the most powerful in Egypt, aside from the pharaoh, of course. It was found during an excavation of an unfinished pyramid that's adjacent to two extensive necropolises, but the identity of the builder or even the name of the unfinished site is still unknown. On a mission to gain that information, the Czech team were working on the site for only two weeks when they made their remarkable and unexpected discovery. The burial complex contains a tomb but also a series of other rooms, and one held a cult chapel which serves as a magnificent example of Old King architecture. In the tomb room, however, there's a limestone coffin and a statue of Kedes, which has been somewhat miraculously preserved in its original location, according to the Czech Institute of Egyptology's report. It even still had some of its original paint. So the statue is also a source of context in the tomb, revealing the name of Kedes and his many titles for us. Based on the inscriptions from the tomb, he was also the sole friend of the pharaoh. This tomb has provided experts with many new insights on the 5th dynasty era. The discovery of the statue and the tomb was dramatic, as it proved in Old Kingdom at least, they did place statues of the dead in their own tombs. Sadly, this is one of those times where grave goods were looted centuries ago, so not much else remains. For number four, we'll learn about ancient Photoshop. Thanks to new x-ray scanning methods, as announced July 13th of 2022, we now know that some of the pharaoh's paintings have been subtly edited over time. Traditionally, the analysis of ancient Egyptian paintings has been conducted in controlled laboratory environments or museum premises. This new study has has instead pioneered a groundbreaking approach. Instead of taking the painting to the lab, bring the lab to the painting. You preserve history, you aren't stealing crap you shouldn't, and nobody gets cursed for tampering. I see nothing but wins here. So the findings focused on two paintings from the Ramesseid period, which were discovered in tomb chapels located near the Theban necropolis. Through the application of x-ray technology, the team scanned specifically a painting of Ramesses II, unveiling hidden details imperceivable to the naked eye. Previously, scholars speculated the painting depicted the pharaoh grieving the loss of his father. However, the latest scan of the portrait challenges the interpretation as Ramesses can be seen beneath a cult canopy before the enthroned Ptah. Additionally, there's adjustments to the crown and other royal items in the portrait of Ramesses II, and he's currently depicted wearing a Wexit collar, which was not historically used during his reign. Underneath that new layer of paint is the original painting of a Shebu collar. These modifications likely reflect shifts in the symbolic significance of these elements over time. This finding suggests that ancient Egyptians continuously adapted their artistic expressions to convey evolving cultural and religious ideologies even when pharaohs had passed. This next tomb is a bit more recent and a bit more strange. Number three is Pet Cemetery. May 28th of 2023 marked the completion of the sixth excavation season in the Saqqara. They had announced their latest finding, two humans and an animal embalming workshop, as well as two tombs of notable officials and their wives, all conjoined together. According to the press release from the Egyptian Ministry of Tourism and Antiquities, the structures date back to the 30th pharaonic dynasty to the Ptolematic period around 2400 years ago. The newest discovered animal embalming workshop was constructed with mud and limestone floors. A number of the rooms and halls were found to contain a large number of pottery, linen, animal embroidery, and different animal burials. Researchers found one room stockpiled with bronze tools used specifically for animal mummification processes and varying sizes of stone beds used to mummify the most sacred of animals. And then they found the similar room but for 
for humans. So large stone beds ended in gutters to facilitate the mummification process with the collection of clay pots nearby to hold entrails and organs, as well as a collection of instruments and ritual vessels. Analysis later determined that the chemical residues discovered in these tombs were a mixture of fragrant or antiseptic oils, tars, and resins, according to the ministry. When all of these paints and resins are brought together, including the Damar tree resin and the Elmi oil, the researchers figured out quite unusually that the raw materials were imported from Asia and other regions of Africa. How did we manage to find a queen we didn't know we lost, but we're still out searching for Nefertiti and Cleopatra? Irony of life. Number two is unearthed but unknown. What are the chances that on the 100 year anniversary of unearthing King Tut's tomb, archaeologists discovered hundreds of tombs and mummies buried in Giza? This genuinely happened on November 4th of 2022, and even crazier, it's attached to a pyramid of a never before known ancient Egyptian queen. So, to quote Zahi Hawass, most burials known in the Saqqara previously were either from the Old Kingdom or Late Period. Now we have 22 interconnected shafts ranging 30 to 60 feet, all with New Kingdom burials, aka this is an unusual but incredible find. Buried within these shafts, archaeologists found huge limestone sarcophagus alongside 300 beautiful coffins, Hawass said. The coffins have individual faces, each one unique, distinguishing between men and women, and are decorated with scenes from the Book of the Dead. Each coffin also has the name of the deceased and often shows the four sons of Horus who protected the organs of the deceased. This shows that mummification reached its peak in the New Kingdom, still quoting Hawass. Some coffins have two lids and most amazing coffins so far had the mask of a woman made completely of solid gold. In addition, they found a pyramid commemorating a previously unknown queen. We have since discovered that her name was Neith and she had never before been known from historical record. It is amazing to literally rewrite what we know of history, adding a new queen to our records. While much of the life of the real Queen Neith still remains unknown, the discovery of her pyramid is likely to provide significant insight into her role. This tomb's discovery was far grander than that of Tut's, yet war overshadowed its discovery, making it back page news. Well, today it gets its rightful attention as number one. It's the Silver Pharaoh. To start some context, in ancient Egyptian culture, gold was considered the flesh of the gods, while silver was believed to be their bones. Gold was abundant in ancient Egypt, making silver more valuable as it had to be imported from Western Asia and the Mediterranean. Okay, now story time. So, amidst the chaos of the Second World War in Western Europe, a French archaeologist found the world's most fabulous tomb. At the world's worst time, as said, the discovery is largely overshadowed despite its magnitude, somewhat understandably as European societies preoccupied with escalating conflict. What amped the magnitude of this find was that the pharaoh was entombed in a solid silver coffin, a massive testament to immense wealth and power that we've never seen in another Egyptian tomb since. Bonus points for the silver anthropod coffin being found in a pink granite coffin, which in turn was encased within a plain granite sarcophagus. Unlike Tut's body, however, Montet only ever found a pile of bones, black dust, and funerary items like the gold mummy board and a spectacular gold mask that would have covered the pharaoh's face and given Tut a run for his mummy. Ha, <laughs> get it? This loss sadly was from groundwater seeping in through to the mummy and most of the wooden items entombed also deteriorated over time. Nonetheless, Montet was able to recover several non-perishable items such as canopic jars and shabatis, along with precious objects inside the sarcophagus, treasures that rival Tut's in their worth. When considering the wealth of the objects found in Susinin's tomb, along with the duration of his reign, it appears that a reassessment of the situation in Egypt during the Third Intermediate Period, or at least during the reign of Sunisid, the Silver Pharaoh, is long overdue. We're gonna start with how hippopotamuses love you too. One thing that many people don't realize is that the creature that kills the most people in Africa each year, quite literally their most dangerous creature on the continent, it's not even a carnivore, it's the hippopotamus, as featured in that annoying Xmas song and that early 2000s Canadian commercial that had us all googling if house hippos are real. To really drill my point in, hippos are the only creature that actually ever scared Steve Irwin. Now, while they may not live on the Nile River anymore today, they certainly did back in the days of ancient Egypt and were sometimes considered a bad omen because of how dangerous they were. They could easily swamp boats, drag people under and drown them, and out of sheer regression, they could maul people to death with their huge mouths and teeth, even if they had no interest in eating them. As proven by King Tut and King Menes, who both got smoked by these animals while possibly out hunting them, which is something the upper class occasionally did. Call that immediate karma. But deadly creatures could be on a smaller physical scale. Rats and bugs. Most diseases that afflicted the ancient Egyptians, which they also happen to have very little protection from, were transferred by pests. Those who lived near the marshes used nets to protect themselves from the mosquitoes netting around beds, doors, windows, you name it. They also had DIY pesticides for their homes, a solution of not 
Natron or Dobbin, and Debit, which is like a crushed charcoal. This mixed powder rub protected them from epidemics and vermin alike. The ancient Egyptians thought that the main reason for the pestilence of the year, which must be the prehistoric terms flu season, was the time of year when dryness and cracking of agricultural lands caused rats to surge up from it. It's also said that the papyrus Silliliere III, that on the 12th day of the first month of winter every year is when disease season began. Obviously they made the connection when you see rats you've got fleas, and when you've got fleas you've got plague. In ancient Egypt the fee of bringing a doctor was very expensive, it could be a copper ingot, a set of vessels, or even, you know, servitude women. This means that when the poor got sick, they would not be able to afford the doctor's fee, and as a result life expectancy was no more than 35 years for the peasant, while the higher classes lived longer, reaching their 80s and 90s. So how else do you conquer horrible bugs? Why? By shaving every part of it. It was incredibly hot in ancient Egypt and running showers only cameoed later in the dynasty. For this reason, finding ways to stay cool, stay hygienic, and also avoid awful pests like lice was very important. So ancient Egyptians shaved their heads and the rest of their bodies clean, and we don't mean just the women either. Having smooth oiled legs, arms, and torsos became the Egyptian beauty standard for both sexes. Even for any women or people hearing this who know what it's like to shave more than the 4x4 four four inch face radius, it can be ridiculous to imagine the chore this must have been for everybody. Shaving your entire body regularly without modern razors, electric trimmers, wax, all while avoiding infection or scrapes on your skins with no water to help. This is where wigs come in. A lot of folks wonder how wigs have become so normalized in our world and ancient Egyptians, really quite a few African continents are the answer. They could be taken on and off, keep your head cool, and they can be tossed into a barrel to be soaked, cleaned, and deloused and worn again. And while I am on a horrible bug roll, worms. Anyone else in Canada forced to read that weird book in high school called The Troop with all those boys stuck on the island with the evil parasitic body infesting worms? No? Nobody? Alright, well while I go to therapy for those nightmares until I'm like 108, let me plant a brain worm on you. Back in the days of ancient Egypt they didn't have the kind of footwear choices we have today. Most people only had very basic sandals and shoes for their everyday work and travel, so foot problems were common and there were ones that were more than just stepping on some shattered pottery or some burnt tootsies from hot sand. Wading into water for whatever, whether it's work, a bath, even just for fun, they had the risk of a shit soma worm getting into their feet and then wreaking havoc on their internal organs, weakening the immune system. Or there's the genea worm, which would hitch a ride in your nose or mouth, travel through your body and eat a path down your leg muscle and lay eggs in them as it goes. They could also get regular old hookworms as well, which could cause iron deficiency, anemia, and all kinds of other love symptoms. Perhaps they should have used some of that magic ancient technology and made more protective footwear so I don't have to think about this for the rest of my night, but no. Huh. Okay, so that was awful. Instead of things that were consuming the ancient Egyptians, how about something they would consume? Sand. Lots of sand. And dude, it effed their teeth right up. Many of our ancient Egyptian videos mention of the incredible innovations Egyptians had in regards to their teeth. They were known for being one of the earliest cultures to use both toothpaste and toothbrushes as well. But this can give the wrong impression. This wasn't a fun little vanity invention, but one of necessity. Sure, they practically had no sugar in their diet, let alone acids, but ancient Egyptians lived in an extremely sandy environment, as we all know. And since they didn't have the insulation, and other vacuums and things we have today, the sand was pretty much everywhere in everything all the time. So yeah, ancient Egyptians were always getting grit in their food, especially their bread, which was the most common thing they ate. This, along with the regularly enjoyed beer, also full of sand, led to some really bad dental problems that they were constantly trying to find solutions for, such as their braces, tooth removal, infection care, and naturally, toothbrush and toothpaste invention. Number five, fake beard. I need one of these, cause uh, yeah, I tried recently and it disappeared off the channel. I was, too, I was too ashamed to come back. Long before Cleopatra, Hatshepsut was the first woman to obtain power as a pharaoh. This is pretty impressive. She was the sixth pharaoh of the 18th dynasty. There were just a few that were women in total, but during her reign back in the mid 1400s BC, following the death of Thutmose II, she was determined on being portrayed as a male, as a male pharaoh. So the pharaoh fake beard, the massive muscles, historians believe that this was done as an act of politics. Now after her passing come 1458 BC, her stepson took the throne, Thutmose III, and he destroyed everything in her name. He, yeah, just scripted, back then it wasn't, you know, hard to just, you break one thing and then everything's gone. Well, mostly everything. Now we have this idiot being like, hey, fake beards, look at that, you missed one. 
Number four, game night. I love board games, even Monopoly, believe it or not. I have the patience for it every now and then. But ancient Egyptians, they also fancied a board game, turns out, who knew? Dogs and Jackals, Mahen, Senate, and 20 Squares. These were all popular go-to games for their ancient Egyptian cottage weekends. Mahen was played around 2500 BC, and the goal was to reach the center of the spiral first. The board was a coiled snake almost. It was quite beautiful. Senate was the most popular game. Queens and kings alike would play this one. Senate had a long board with 30 squares painted on it. Now, of course, the rules are still unknown and heavily debated, just like Monopoly. But you had three rows of 10 squares. The last five squares are decorated. So it's assumed that this game was themed on the afterlife. Plus, King Tut was buried with one of these game boards. There's something very Jumanji about this that I want to know more of, but I also don't want to know more of. Why was he buried with a board game? That's kind of terrifying. There's also some paintings of Queen Nefertiti playing a board game of sorts. Yeah, it kind of looks a lot like chess. Imagine playing a pharaoh in chess. My palms would be so sweaty. I'd be like, checkmate, please don't exile me. Thanks so much. Let's play again sometime. Peace. Number three, the first peace treaty. Bizarre at the time? Absolutely. Definitely. This is a first. The first peace treaty in history was back in 1271 BC. Now at this point in time, Egyptians and the Hittite Empire, they were fighting over modern day Syria. Now this conflict had been lasting centuries and come 1274 BC, the Battle of Kadesh was now underway. At this point, there's tons of bloodshed, no clear victor in sight. So what's left to do at this point? A peace treaty, right? Hopefully, ideally, Ramses II and King Hattasuli III both negotiated a peace treaty where both sides would aid each other if a third party decided to now get involved. A copy of the treaty can be found in New York right above the entrance to the United Nations Security Council chamber. Pretty impressive. I have a license plate above my room, so that's almost as cool, I guess. It's also in the Guinness Book of World Records as the oldest peace treaty, so that's how you know it's official. Guinness confirms it. Moving on. Number two, renewed passport. Now I'm thinking about where my passport is and I'm immediately panicking. I'm like, oh, which shelf? Ooh. Before our big bad haunting number one, we'll do a fun one with some recent history. This is cheeky. Passports are important and they're a pain to replace. But did you know that you can still get one even if you've been dead for thousands of years? Well, now you do. You just have to be a pharaoh though. That's the only rule. You have to be a pharaoh or some sort of king. Pharaoh Ramses II, we just talked about him, one of ancient Egypt's greatest rulers. He got a passport back in 1974. Insane, the same time my grandma did probably. After being exhumed and put on display for so long, it was decided that it's now time to send this lost king off to Paris to get touched up. Now, obviously, you're not going to list this pharaoh king as luggage. That would be super disrespectful. So the Egyptian government gave Ramses II his own official Egyptian passport for his commute with a photo. Just in case you didn't know. On the passport, he had his info. It's all great. He has age, very old, occupation, a king. And in case it wasn't obvious, it was stated that the king was deceased. Looking at him, you're like, oh, yeah, certainly. Yeah, go on in. Definitely dead. For sure dead. Don't even have to look twice. We're good. And finally, number one, trusty servant. In ancient Egypt, it was common for servants to accompany their masters into the afterlife. Whenever they go, now you have to go. Horrible, right? This practice reflected the belief that individuals needed assistance and companionship even in the realm of the dead. Hashtag needy. Servants were considered essential for ensuring the comfort and well-being of the deceased here and again in the afterlife, which doesn't make a lot of sense, but again, a long time ago, different beliefs. They would be depicted in tomb paintings and inscriptions, and their statues or figurines would be placed in these tombs to then serve the deceased. These servants were believed to continue their duties in the afterlife, providing sustenance, performing daily tasks, and maintaining the deceased social status. Like, when does it end, guy? Like, fuck. Come on. The inclusion of servants and burial rituals exemplifies the importance of social hierarchy and the idea of continuity in ancient Egyptian culture. So while it's crazy to us, it's, well, it's very important then. It's quite important now. Okay, so let's talk about horrible hygiene. Maybe an over-exaggeration, but hygiene of any kind was better than whatever the hell they were trying to accomplish in Europe without showering. At least the people of ancient Egypt considered it an important enough cultural value that they'd wash once a day. Even if it meant they also shaved their head, crunched down beetles for makeup, and rubbed dung on their acne. 2,000 years before Hesse Ray was credited for being the world's first dentist, the Egyptians were making their own toothbrush by fraying the ends of twigs. The toothpaste used was a powder like that vegan one at Lush that makes you feel like you're chewing on chalk. It was made of ox hooves, burnt eggshells, and pumice. Mmm, kiss me good morning after you rub that on your teeth with your dental twig, babe. Speaking of, for those whose breath smelled as bad as the armpits of the lower class Egyptians, also had numerous mouthwashes. Some had to be chewed up and spat out like bran or celery. Honey was combined with boiled herbs and spices such as cinnamon and myrrh to form a dehydrated pellet, which they also used as breath mints. And 
speaking of armpit, the Egyptians had a deodorant body rub made of ostrich egg, turtle shell, and roasted tamarisk. Nothing like waking up bright and early for a day of building pyramids and the first thing you have to do is some casual Harry Potter potion making just to not smell like camel crap. Speaking of hygiene, your clothes were never clean. So even if your body was haha germaphobe, you still aren't safe. In the later periods of ancient Egyptian history, people began wearing clothes made of linen, not hides, cottons, furs, and rendered leathers like they used to. Linen was light and flexible, so it was good for the hot Egyptian climate. However, linen was white, meaning the clothes showed dirt very easily, an issue they hadn't really had to deal with before. But most materials they'd worn didn't hold up well underwater like linen did, so the ancient Egyptians started doing laundry more often to get rid of the dirt. But they washed their clothes in the Nile, where people also relieved themselves, and dumped garbage, and human bodies. So uh, this meant that the Egyptians washed their clothes in water filled with parasites and bacteria. Even if drying it in the sun baked most of that away, you then still had the world's chafiest linen. To learn who did the laundry, the labor, the provision, and the caretaking, let's discuss family values. You may as well pop a little white picket fence up around the pyramids, guys, because nobody idealized the nuclear family quite like the ancient Egyptians, who held it at the core of their society. There was a tremendous pride in one's family, and lineage was traced through both the mother's and the father's lines. Everyone, even the gods and goddesses, were married. While premarital relations or any romps between unmarried people were socially acceptable, an unmarried man was seen as incomplete, and schoolboys were advised to wed early and father as many children as possible. Once married, however, couples were expected to be sensually faithful to each other. Egyptians, with exception to the king, were in theory monogamous, and many records indicate the couples expressed true affection for each other. Although the institution of marriage was taken seriously, if you don't end up working out with the person you married at 15, shocker, divorce was not uncommon, let alone remarrying, so at least that was one little less impossible thing. Until marriage, following their parents' footsteps, boys were trained in the trades and professions by their fathers and uncles, while girls stayed at home to learn from their mothers. In their early adult years, girls would marry, move from home, and the cycle would start again. Would start again with the dreaded childbirth. Egypt had the highest birth rate in the ancient world, and yet things were far from perfect. Although the Egyptians understood the general functions of parts of the reproductive system, the relationship between said parts were sometimes unclear to them. Like the origin of a man's love potion, since it was white, is from his bones, because those are also white, and nothing else was. Logic, eh? Most married women spent most of their lives either pregnant or breastfeeding. With little medical advice available, amulets and charms bearing figures of the pregnant hippopotamus goddess Tarawet and the mini demigoddess Bess were often used to protect both the mother and her unborn child, as children of all sexes were valued and desired. The mother prepared for birth by removing her clothing, loosening her hair, or just snatching her wig off. They did wear wigs. The birth of the child was a great joy, as well as a serious concern given the high mortality rate and stress of childbirth on a mother. So a midwife was an important career in Egypt. The everyday mothers squatted on birthing bricks for delivery, wealthy households had specially constructed huts or pools, and the midwife used a sharp obsidian or flint knife to cut the umbilical cord. The midwife was also on standby to try and help in any troubling birth situations that may arise. After childbirth, you breastfed for how long? Next one is latch off already. One of the best ways to maintain a healthy infant under the less than sanitary conditions that prevailed in ancient times was by breastfeeding. In addition to transfer of antibodies through mother's milk, breastfeeding also offered protection from foodborne diseases. If your kid isn't exposed to potentially contaminated food at the time when their immune system is at its weakest, they're inherently going to survive longer. Way of the jungle, y'all. It's why we don't feed babies chicken. Indirect evidence for this occurring in ancient Egypt actually came to us from a number of cemeteries where young adults and unders death rates peaked at times that correlated with the introduction to solid foods in their body. Prolonged lactation also offered a number of health advantages to you as the mother. Primarily, it reduces the chances of conceiving another child too soon by hormonally suppressing ovulation, which allows the mother more enjoyable stress-free times with her husband between pregnancies. So how long is prolonged? A minimum of a three-year period for suckling was recommended in the instructions of any from the new kingdom, and therefore struck an honestly unconscious but evolutionary important balance between the needs of procreation, the health of a mother, and the survival of a child. Number five, get to work. Also speaking of movies, you know that classic scene where the prisoners are out on work duty, everyone's in their like orange jumpsuits, they're cleaning up all the garbage? Okay, that but ancient. A lot of criminals, thieves, and no good rotten folks were used for hard manual labor. Pretty classic. And you guessed it, 
building the pyramids. While the pyramids are often misconceived of being built by YouTube's least favorite S word, it was most likely built by a combination of people, mostly crafted skillsmen and builders, followed by crooks and those wishing to get out of the hot hot sun. The job was dangerous, hot like I said, and oftentimes heavy lifting, too much for me. While normal workers were granted two days off a year because it is backbreaking work, the criminals were tasked with quarrying stone with no days off. No machines, no iron tools, I mean it's all, oh man that must be awful. Just the horror. <laughs> just, just, just the worst. Number 4. Tarnished Reputation This one actually makes a lot of sense really. Depending on how heinous the crime is, you wouldn't want this for stealing some bubble gum. So if you found yourself in hot trouble or the principal's office, which I was never in for being a bad boy, I was good every single time, I promise. No one believes me still, but I, I was. The vizier or government would keep track of who's been sneaking the tombs like Laura Croft. Hence, they could use this information to tarnish your reputation. It was also used against false witnesses and those wishing to gain something from a legal situation. Those that wish to bear false witness would immediately have something amputated because that's the law around here, partner. Number 3. Fair Pharaoh The great Pharaoh Bacchus is an interesting subject to say the least. First off, I had to say his name a couple times before I really understood what was going on there. I blame the dyslexia, but that's just how it goes, baby. But secondly, he's the guy that takes power and goes, whoa, 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 guys, maybe not so harsh. And I use this term lightly, but he improved human rights, specifically improvements for prisoners who owe debt. Hmm, sounds like someone might have owed someone a few bucks himself, hmm. Interestingly enough, his laws were influenced by Greek laws, who then influenced more Greek laws, who those Greek laws influenced Roman laws, who then influenced our modern law. There's a, there's a big chain of events there, trust me, it all matches up. Number two, your nose knows. Knows to stay out of trouble. I say this one for the bottom of the list because, well, it's just so awful and weird. In a town called Rhino Cholera, not too far from Cairo, but 200 miles was a town full of people with no noses. What? I know. This wasn't a Red Skull Comic Con convention, but a penal colony of sorts. Maybe the first. These people were or had been accused of thievery, and for this they had their noses removed to show anyone who visited what kind of people they really were. In a world of infection and disease, I cannot recommend this. It's not a good idea. You, you probably wouldn't make it after they removed it. The name Rhino Cholera, which literally translates to Clip Nose, the town of Clip Nose. That's, that's not good. Number one in God's hands. Remember before I mentioned the priests used to handle verdicts? Well, it's crazier than you might think, actually. While the Pharaoh was top dog in ancient Egypt, and I mean he was top dog, you don't, you don't get past the Pharaoh, the gods controlled everything and the Egyptians worshipped their gods. Crops, weather, justice, I mean they did everything. So oftentimes the priest verdicts would come down from the gods themselves. If that wasn't enough, the god Mahis was responsible for those criminals in the afterlife where they would also receive comeuppance. Uh oh, you're not safe anywhere. A sort of jail in the sky if you will. Alcatraz has nothing on that. You're bad here, you're bad in the sky, you're bad everywhere, bad in the afterlife. So that's why folks, you behave yourselves. Keep your nose, behave yourself. Number 10, the time warp. Okay, here's a very trippy fact for you. We all know ancient Rome, right? The lovable empire that took over a large portion of the world at its peak. Trust me, I'm going somewhere with this. Caesar, Augustus, the Colosseum. Yeah, those guys, we all know how long ago that was, right? 2,000 years or more. They were pretty cool dudes. Today they are remembered for being a very successful empire and their triumphs. Well, what if I told you that the Romans are to us what the ancient Egyptians were to the Romans? Does that make sense? That makes sense. And they were still alive to tell the story. Well, at least some of them and some of it. Yes, that's right. When Rome was taking over, it was understood that Egypt was a land of great antiquity and there was much to learn. However, most of what we know of Egypt comes from Egyptian tombs, pyramids, and Egyptology from the early 20th century. Still pretty cool though. Number 9. Board Games 
Call me crazy, but I love board games. My two favorite are arguably the most depressing. One being an actual fictionalized version of life and seeing who can rack up the biggest mortgages after having six kids as a police officer with a chef's salary. Ooh, fun. And the other is a recreation of the real estate moguls that charge exuberant amounts of rent during the Great Depression in the 30s. Wow, fun. Thanks, Parker Brothers. This may be because I have ancestors in ancient Egypt. I, I probably don't, but uh, we're just gonna roll with that joke anyway. I make bad jokes like that because ancient Egyptians loved board games. That, that was my connection. Yeah, I know, right? Games like 20 Squares, Hounds and Jackals, which is pretty much just snakes and ladders, and the most popular, Semet which tasks players with moving their pieces on squares and eventually off the board. Kind of like Sorry, which is also one of my favorite games. I love Sorry. I think that we had a Canadian version called Getting Into Trouble. You know, the thing in the middle and you bop it. Remember that thing, the dice, remember that? And you say, what are you guys doing? Getting into trouble, mom. So lame, so lame, dude. Number eight, Labor Strike. To say that it took a lot of manpower to build the pyramids, or really anything the ancient Egyptians ever built, is a little bit of an understatement. A lot of work went into it. Not only are the builds massive in scale, but also extremely complex and detailed, fooling some engineers today. They don't know how exactly they did it. Can you imagine building or moving all of those massive stones in the African heat and sun? I would need so much water. Just like today, it's really hot today. Well, as it turns out, this wasn't always the greatest job on planet Earth. Oh, surprise! And in one incident in the 12th century BC, the workers under Ramses III organized what may have been the very first labor strike. The workers had not received their grain rations and thus hid away in the monasteries until their woes were heard. It worked, and they were given their rations. Oh, so cool. The first labor strike, that's so weird. They have modern stuff too. Wow. Number seven, time warp again. Okay, here's one that's just kind of a head scratcher, but very true. And it has to do with the age of the Great Pyramids. The truth is, those bad boys are old, really old, older than your grandpa. And for a lot of ancient Egypt's history, they were there, regardless if the citizens actually knew anything about them. Constructed around 2560 BC, Ooh, a long time ago. Cleopatra, the most famous of all pharaohs, and the chicest of all celebrities in the 60s. I mean, come on, it's Elizabeth Taylor. I mean, she's a good looking gal. Despite what modern depictions of ancient Egypt will have you believe, Cleopatra actually lived closer to the moon landing than she did the construction of the pyramids, which is really hard to think about. She was closer to JFK, the pyramids, Vietnam, and not the pyramids. That's, wow, that's, a, that's, a, that's kind of hard for my brain to wrap my head around that. Number six, bowling. The next time you find yourself in a bowling alley and find yourself a little queasy, and you're not sure if it's the smell coming from your bowling shoes or the radioactive microwave nacho cheese you just ate at the snack counter, you can thank the Egyptians. No, not because they made sure to play weird animations on the outdated TVs hanging from the ceiling that were outdated the second you walked in there as a kid. They're old then. Or the carpet that screams 1980s and please wash me. But because they invented the game itself, usually done with stone pins and a stone ball. It was quite popular amongst the crowns back then. Very cool. Obviously, they didn't have the animations, but I think that makes it. You know, remember those, you know those weird like bowling animations you know what I'm talking about? Number five, can't take it with you. In life, you live and then you pass on. If you believe in the home send signs your mom hangs up in her kitchen, then there's gonna be a lot of living, laughing, and loving with that. Ancient Egyptians believed in taking things with them to the afterlife. Yeah, pretty much everything was coming with them. Gold, treasure, organs, except the brain, and pretty much just anything you would need for that kind of adventure. Well, animals were no different. Oftentimes when discovering tombs of kings in the main chamber, or sometimes in their own, were statues of cats and dogs, and naturally, mummified kitties and doggies. Now, I love my pets just as much as the next guy, but uh, a discovery in 2019 revealed a tomb with statues, mummies, and even some preserved crocodiles. Ooh, weird, that's a weird pet. Number four, Tomb KV5. Sometimes you pass things off without giving them the proper time and attention. Like the fact that your middle toe on one of your feet is a little longer than the same one on the other side, and you're like, ah, Ah, it's probably fine, but it's actually a mutation that all of your ancestors had and it's the reason you can walk faster than everyone else. Not that that's happened to me or anything, but the archaeologists of tomb KV-5 know what I'm talking about, sort of. Basically, KV-5 was not studied very well, and in 1995, it turns out that it was actually one of the largest tombs ever created in the Valley of the Kings. 
So far, we have found around 121 chambers and corridors, and we think there will be 150 total. The tomb was used for the sons of Ramses II, who as we know had over 100 kids, so the size of the tomb kind of checks out. So far, we've only confirmed six, but there are likely to be around 20 of his sons down there. Number three, the Pyramids of Giza. A lot of people include the Great Pyramids of Giza on their list of Egyptian discoveries, but like, how, how, could, how could you miss them? Okay, obviously people can see these bad boys from miles away. It would be kind of hard to lose something like that, as Adam said. But then again, as a man, I take pride in losing my car keys every time I need to use them. But more specifically, it was the discovery of the inner chambers of the pyramids that really kicked off archaeology. The verdict? Well, these pyramids not only hold riches and riches of historical knowledge, but the engineering involved is out of this world, which, you know, is kind of how some people think they were constructed today. The complexity and craftsmanship the complexity and craftsmanship still has people scratching their heads. As for me, I believe that with enough careful planning and engineering, mixed in with a whole heap of uh, forced labor, you can just get about anything done. There's still much to be learned about these giants in the desert. Ooh. Number two, Aten. Even today, we are still making huge discoveries in Egypt. I mean, maybe not specifically today, April 27th, or whenever you watch this, but in this day and age. In 2020, we discovered a 3,000 year old city buried in the sand, and it's probably the biggest discovery since our number one spot. The city named Aten, or the Rise of Aten, is the largest city of its kind that we have found and gives us a really good look at life during Egypt's most profitable era. That would be the rule of Amon. That would be the rule of Amonhotep III. Amonhotep IV is his son, who would drastically change the country's direction. Following his father's death, the fourth changed his name to Akhenaten, abandoned the old Egyptian gods besides the sun god Aten, and moved the royal seat from Thebes to the new city of Akhetaten, which is known as Amarna. He was a weird one, but this city wasn't weird. It was impressive, with an administration area as well as residential districts, production area where mud bricks, amulets, and other goods for buildings and temples were made, along with a bakery. Yeah, I love my croissants covered in sand too. Number one, King Tut, the man, the myth, the legend. Besides the pyramids, the sand, and the hot sun, nothing is more famous out of Egypt than King Tut. Well, why is this? Is he not just another royal bro who's just big chilling in his tomb? Eh, yeah, sort of, but his tomb is very unique actually. Unfortunately for Egyptians and archaeologists alike, a lot of the tombs have been cleaned out by grave robbers and crooks, some of which are just long gone. The stuff could have been heisted at any point really, we're just not sure. King Tut's tomb, however, was pretty well untouched, and because of this, we got the chance to learn about a king who really didn't do too much. I think a sarcophagus stands out the most, the, the gold and the blue, it's beautiful. I love it. It's good aesthetic. We're gonna start with peace treaties. Egypt all does know Ramses II as the pharaoh who restored Egypt's relations with Syria and built a lot of neat temples in the desert back in the 1200s BC. And he's the one in that Disney movie whose first son gets smoked by the plague. Kind of a wild guy, so we'll talk about him quite a bit in this vid. Anyways, for over two centuries, the Egyptians fought against the Hittite Empire for control of lands in modern day Syria. The conflict gave rise to a bloody boot down, such as the 1247 BC Battle of Kadesh, but by the time of the pharaoh Ramesses II, neither side had emerged as a clear victor, and this was just becoming all drawn out and bloody and just plain stupid, especially with both empires facing threats from people outside each other. But who's ever going to be the first to wave the white flag, let's be real, when it comes to two dudes, y'all are notoriously known for just beating each other up, shaking hands, and best friends again. So in 1259 BC, the two said ah to hell with it, let's do lunch, and Ramesses II and the Hittite king Hatsusili III negotiated a famous peace treaty, one that was either the first known in creation, or one of the earliest ever. This agreement ended the conflict and decreed the two kingdoms would aid each other in the event of an invasion by a third party. This treaty is now recognized as one of the earliest surviving peace accords, and a copy can be seen above the entrance to the United Nations Security Council. How about some ancient Egyptian body dysmorphia, because bodies are supposed to look like this, right? That's what Akhenaten was probably wondering, and it must have been awkward as hell for fine as so Queen Nefertiti and normal looking son King Tut to try and lie their way through any reply to that, because this whack job was known for two things. Firstly, as 
Egyptians who forced monotheism on Egypt so brutally that when he died, his son had to awkwardly erase his legacy. And secondly, he was one funny looking dude. He had an hourglass figure like a BBL baddie, an elongated head with a square jaw jutting out, big curved almond eyes, and let's say he could have filled out a bra better than me. So, Egyptians like to play Photoshop with their selfies the way we do now, and the first depictions of Ak, his body and head are normal. But after he forced monotheism, that literally destroyed the economy and empire, his gender in sculptures and carvings became more ambiguous. Three explanations. First, he's the most hated pharaoh in history. So I mean, come on, artistic license, get some anger out. Second, perhaps his changing appearance was metaphorical, meant to portray Ak as the father and mother of all humankind. Third, is that it was a genetic disorder, such as amitrace excess syndrome, where the body released equal levels of both hormones. But we all know what the likely one was, seeing as these guys could quite literally not keep their hands or really any appendage out of their family members. I'm not gonna lie, I can't handle having eyeliner on for three hours that me and my roommate go out. Meanwhile, the pharaohs had obligatory face beat like they were working at ancient Sephora every day. Early Greek traders who visited Egypt were astonished by the sophistication and precision with which Egyptians took care of their skin and hair and decorated their bodies. Europeans remarked that almost everyone was wearing makeup even in public places and that'd be accurate as both men and women were known to wear copious amounts of the stuff believing it gave them the protection of the gods Horus and Ra who were always fighting or banging each other and doing so in a full face of makeup like some spectacular fursuit wearing drag queens. The only distinguishing factor between men and women's makeup was that men's makeup was simple while women's was often heavier and more complex. The distinguishing factor of all makeup, however, was wealth. Nobles could afford the fresher or less diluted products, while lower status had to use makeup from poorer quality materials, which sucks since they worked in the sun all day, and higher quality coal you lined your eyes with, the better it reduced sun reflection. This act will also protect them from evil spirits and eye diseases, as they believe their makeup had magical hearing powers, and they weren't entirely wrong. Research has shown that lead-based cosmetics worn along the Nile actually staved off eye infections. All right, you annoying ancient astronaut people, this is for you, Tut's space knife. I am not sitting here doing the work for y'all, pretending we all don't know who King Tut is. He was the child pharaoh, smoked by a hippo bite, cursed tomb, blah, 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 blah. So we're just going to get right to it and say he had a knife literally from space. Specifically, a small dagger, but whatever effing y'all, this thing is so sharp. To this day, the TSA would tackle you sooner than let you board anything with it. They found it in Tut's tomb in 1920s with all that other magical treasury hunky-dory that they stole out of there, and it was originally believed to be forged from the iron heart of a meteorite. Originally, ah, keyword, see, Egyptians didn't have the ability to smelt. They weren't actually suitably advanced in that realm. So they especially wouldn't be able to forge a weapon from space metal, let alone crack open a meteorite to get to it, or know that was even an option. This has led historians to presume that the dagger was a gift from a foreign nation that did possess smelty technology. While historians are pretty confident the foreign nation wasn't the Martians, they haven't explicitly ruled that out either, so I guess those ancient alien guys might have a point. If you like stuff like this, check out our top 10 alien hieroglyphs found in ancient history video. The story of how two pharaohs throw down over pet hippos. So, Pharaoh Sekinenri Teo, I'm gonna call him Sek, the second, kept a pool full of pet hippopotamuses, letting his massive pets splash and play all day. Obviously, you don't get close because these are blind rage death animal machines, but this guy loved his hippos so much he could kill for them. He was willing to die for them. In fact, he literally did just that. This is back when Egypt was divided and the most powerful Egyptian kingdom was called Haikos, which was ruled by Pharaoh Apopi. Being a lesser king, Sek was required to pay tributes to Apopi out of respect. He could handle the humiliation of living under the tyranny of another man, RIP fragile male ego, but as long as Apopi didn't rub it in or act like an ass about it. So that's exactly what Apopi did. He went right for the sore spot by telling Sek to get rid of his hippos. Apparently they were too loud and Apopi couldn't sleep at night in his own house that was 750 kilometers away. Yeah, no. Sek says, hey, I can handle you bullying me constantly, but leave the hippos out of this. And he would not tolerate any further insults to his hippos. This, he declared, was grounds for war. That's what they did. Sek even died in combat, fighting for his right to a hippo pool. The war didn't end when he died, however. His son kept it going. Two generations of kings fought for a hippo pool. And in time, they won. By the end of the war, Egypt had unified once more. All because of one man's love for his hippos. Sorostis, the genital king, is number five. Why genital king? Well, aside from being one of the greatest military commanders in Egyptian history, he commemorated his success in a unique way, by setting up a big pillar with a picture of someone's genitals on it. Male or female, he wasn't picky. He sent warships and troops to every corner of the known world and stretched his kingdom further than anyone else ever had, leaving these pillars on sites of every battleground. Aside from genital 
Ilya the Pillars were of course ingrained with how he had subdued his enemies and how certain he was that the gods were in favor of his invade everyone policy. Quite cocky of him. The genitals depicted were based off of how valiantly their opponents had fought their invasion. Male depiction indicated that they were strong and brave soldiers. But the female depiction, well, it meant the word that we are all thinking. These pillars lore left all across the continent and they stood the test of time. 1500 years later, after being erected, they still stand in sea. Syria, engraved with the genitals of failure. Look up the word spoil and you'll see number 4 is Pepe II. He was the longest ruling Egyptian monarch, surviving 94 years on the throne. The first half of this rule he brought prosperity and grandeur to Egypt. Second half, nowhere close. In fact, it's the mark of the sharp decline of the old kingdom of Egypt as economic disarray was due to him virtually having no oversight. Pepe was made pharaoh in his early teen years, so naturally he got the spoiled brat treatment from mommy. A great example is shortly after being crown, an explorer sent to trade and collect ivory, ebony and other precious items had written him a letter reporting that he had met a dancing pygmy. Why? This is the greatest thing Pepe had ever heard! He had to see it for himself. So he demanded its transport back immediately and to abandon all precious materials they'd gathered in return for a high reward. Well, he got his dancing pygmy and he got pretty much everything he's ever asked for. He learned to accept that he was more important than other people. By the time he'd grown up, he was so corrupt that he made his serf strip naked cover themselves in honey and follow him around just to keep the flies away. Number 3 is the klepto gaslighting Amasis. He's remembered as a total prick. Amasis actually made his way onto the throne after the current pharaoh had sent him to calm down a rebellion, but when he got there he realized the rebels had a pretty good chance of winning, so he decided to lead them instead. Amasis decided the best way to tell the king about his change of sides and a declaration of war was by lifting his leg, farting, and telling the messenger to take that back to the king. He was a rampant alcoholic as well as a klepto maniac. Apparently he would steal his friends' stuff, put it in his own temples, and then try to convince them that they had never owned it in the first place. However, amongst all his bratty behavior, Amasis brought some major reform to oracles. One example actually comes from when he was a poor thief on the street. When he had been caught stealing, he'd been sent to stand in front of oracles who were supposedly be able to divine tell whether he was innocent or guilty. Well, once he was king, he remembered which oracles had pronounced him innocent of the crimes he had committed and had them punished for fraud. Because if they'd actually been able to speak to the gods, they would have known he was always guilty. Number two is cutting down on crime, Actus Sains. Amasis wasn't tolerated for long and he was overthrown the way he'd done to his predecessor. This time the rebellion was led by the Ethiopian Actus Sains, who believed in a gentler approach to kinghood. Actus Sains fought for the crown literally because of a magic spell he'd heard about and also to deal with Egypt's criminals in a flashy new way, controlled exile. Every person who committed a crime he ruled would have their nose cut off and then they'd be sent off to the town he called Rhino Clora, literally the town of cut off noses. It was exclusively populated by these now noseless criminals struggling to survive in the harsh landscape, drinking dirty water and eating trash or the odd stray quail that came through. Something like this may have seemed harsh, but it was actually considered benevolence at the time. Roman chronologers of Rinacola, or Rincolora, whichever it's pronounced, wrote an example of how Acta Sains was actually considering a kindly manner towards his subjects. So keep that in mind when you're doing a comparison of now versus then. And in at number one is Akhenaten. This pharaoh was so hated that the Egyptians themselves wiped his name out of history. Born Amenhotep, he changed his name to a Ahak, I'm gonna call him Ak, in accordance with this radical monotheistic drive. His new name meant that he is of service to the Aten, in honor of what he believed to be the one true god, Aten, the sun god. Acted everything in the name of the sun god. He moved Egypt's capital from Thebes to Amarnia, and then renamed it in Egyptian to mean Horizon of Aten, and then he ordered a new capital city be built there. He chose the site because it was uninhabited. It was not the property of anyone else except Aten. He moved an estimated 20,000 people into this developing city and forced them to build it. These people had to push through everything. Based on the bones found in the town cemetery, more than two thirds of his workers broke a bone while they are working and a good one third of them broke their spines. Almost everyone was malnourished. When he enforced monotheism, Ak failed to realize that the temples of Egypt were the national, socionomic, and cultural hubs. It was the gods priests that oversaw the industries of agriculture and craftsmanship through their patronage and they who served as pillars of their communities. So by stripping these temples of authority, he caused Egypt's biggest 
recession and an entire empire nearly collapsed because of him. So it's no wonder after his death, Egypt immediately went back to polytheism and they also abandoned the new city he'd made them build. They destroyed his statues, his effigies, his monuments and they removed him from their list of kings and history books. In fact they did this so efficiently that we didn't really even know about him until his remains were found all alone in the city he had forced his subjects to create. Number 10. Tutankhamun This guy is arguably the most famous Egyptian pharaoh. So what is he doing at the top of the list? Well, King Tut wasn't famous for anything he really did in his lifetime. I mean, he was a young pharaoh, but someone on this list was technically pharaoh since he was two. No, he wasn't famous for anything he really did. Instead, Tutankhamun's tomb, discovered in 1922, was one of the greatest archaeological discoveries ever. It was almost entirely intact, and his sarcophagus was incredible. Tutankhamun only lived to the age of 20, and how he lost the spark of life is actually still a mystery. He may not have done much other than a lot of religious reforms, but he managed to find another way of living forever. Number 9. Djoser So, with King Tut, he didn't really do much in his short lifetime. With Djoser, we actually don't really know a lot of what he did. Also like Tutankhamun, it was what he did for and after his departure from life that made him famous. Djoser was responsible for the construction of the Limestone Step Pyramid at Saqqara, the first of its kind. It was a huge architectural achievement. A building that stays structurally sound no matter how big it gets? Well knock me down and call me Susan. The pyramid was actually completed after he lost the will to live by his official Imhotep. Number 8. Amenhotep III Okay. On to the members of the list who we know did something significant for Egypt during their time on the earth. Amenhotep III ruled an artistically and financially successful Egypt. He had pretty stellar reviews on Google for his trade relations which boosted up the economy of Egypt, but it was his artistic side that got him a bit more of a lasting recognition. He is the pharaoh with the most statues of himself. He created tons of monuments and a lot of stone scarabs that still hold up with tons of stories of historical events. I want some statues myself. Is, is that weird? Probably. Number 7. Hatshepsut Now look, women in Egypt had high status and were respected more than in other parts of the world at the time. But a female pharaoh, while not unheard of, was unfortunately still pretty rare. Hatshepsut here was known as the most successful of those female pharaohs. Her father, King Thutmose I, wanted her to inherit the throne, and to that end, she was brought up learning how to lead. She reigned for 21 years after the death of her husband, and everything she did, from tons of construction projects to creating trade routes, went off without a single hitch. The people of Egypt lived in peace for her entire rule. Number 6. Thutmose III Thutmose III was, surprisingly, the son of Thutmose II, who was the husband of Hatshepsut. You know, number 7, the most successful female pharaoh. So that's the kind of cloth we're working with here. Thutmose was only two when his father bit the dust. So while he was technically the next pharaoh, his stepmother took over with him as co-ruler. This guy's contributions to the Egyptians were tremendous though. He was literally called the Napoleon of Egypt, which Shouldn't Napoleon be the Thutmose III of France? Either way, Thutmose III. He helped expand Egypt like none before. He was a dope warrior and he helped in the construction of a lot of stuff. Most importantly, the Temple of Karnak. That's how you make mama proud. Number 5. Bloodletting The practice of bloodletting was common all over the world, but it may have gotten its start in ancient Egypt. It's a quite simple procedure, really. Black bile out of whack? Lose some blood. Can't stop coughing and sneezing? Drain some blood! Been possessed by demons and now they curse and haunt you as they run up and down your bloodstream? Drain some blood! The question is, however, was this really helping? The short answer, no. No, it wasn't. Besides feeling lightheaded and going pale, this didn't really achieve much. Since the days of old were filled with all kinds of other ailments that would easily end someone's life before the spooky demons running up and down someone's bloodstream ever would. I don't feel good. Oh, we better bleed grandpa again. I don't know. Like what? Number four, plastic surgery. Hey, there's nothing wrong with a little cosmetic surgery. I for one feel that if it'll make you feel better, go for it. Feel better about yourself. Do it. I don't think there's any shame in that. 
It's been around for a long time, so long that ancient Egyptians might have come up with the first nose jobs. Obviously not like the ones today, but they were knowledgeable in surgeries. After all, you open the chest cavity of a dozen kings and you jot some stuff down on some papyrus, you learn a thing or two. More interesting than shaving down your own beak, however, was their implementation of the prosthesis limbs. Yes, all the way back then. One mummy was actually found with a fake toe. When tested in the modern day with period accurate sandals, it proved to work quite well and moved more efficiently than first thought. Again, for the time, this was pretty advanced. Number 3. The Ode of the Nile Imagine people working all day in the blistering sands of Egypt, where the sun beams down on you like well, the sun in the desert, lifting massive rocks and carving them to shape. I don't know about you guys, but I would be sweating. And that also means I wouldn't be smelling too fresh, resembling that of a high school locker room. Yuck. Well, the Egyptians knew this was an issue, so they came up with what was probably the first underarm deodorant. Using nice herbs and other items that had pleasant aromas, and stuck them where the odor was coming from. In your bits. I just know that after a long day of hard labor in the sun, I would need more than cinnamon sticks and lavender to tame the odor of my sweaty lumberjack armpits. That's just how it goes. Number 2. The Egyptian Brazilian The 70s have come and gone, and a popular trend today is to be hairless. Everywhere. Even in places where you didn't think it was possible to grow hair when you were younger. Egyptians took it upon themselves to remove all their hair. Well, at least most of it. Not because the Nile River had nice beaches, but because of lice. Oh, yuck. While not an exact cure for the itchy bugs that plague schools across America, it did seem to help. And if you've ever had lice before, you know how bad that sucks. I had them once, it was the worst. She cut my hair, shaved, shaved my head, lots of baths. It's just, it's, it's no fun, man. I'm too cute for that. I don't want that. Number one. Wario breath. Wow. Okay. It makes sense that Egyptians would come up with breath mints and mouthwash. They fed their laborers diets of foods that contained a lot of onions and garlic. Sure, I'm just like everyone else who cooks. And when the recipe asks for one onion, eh, maybe I put in two. When it asks for two cloves of garlic, maybe I put in four. You gotta love that flavor. It was thought that they helped fight off disease and they were kind of right. However, after eating all that flavor, your breath would be something rancid. So herbs and mints were used to help quell the breath that could peel the paint off of walls. Thank God. Number 10 on our countdown, the wax crocodile will be presented in a story form. Once upon a time, as all good stories begin, a pharaoh, accompanied by his counselors and servants, paid a visit to the villa of his chief scribe, behind which there was a garden with a stately summer house and a broad artificial lake. One of the servants of the pharaoh was a handsome young man who catches the eye of the scribe's wife. She sends him gifts, and they begin to have secret meetings at the summer house and swim in its lake. The chief butler informs the scribe of his wife's affair, and the scribe in turn asks the butler to bring him a magic box. Inside was a small wax crocodile that he placed in the hands of his butler saying, cast this image into the lake behind the youth when he next bathes himself. The lovers were together in the lake the next day and the butler stealthily put the wax croc into the water, which immediately gave it life. It became a great crocodile that seized the handsome man suddenly and took him away. Seven days passed and the scribe tells the pharaoh of the wonder that had been done and made a request his majesty should accompany him to the villa lake. The pharaoh did so, and when they both stood beside the lake in the garden, the scribe spoke magic words, bidding the crocodile to appear, and as he commanded, so did it do. The great reptile came out of the water, carrying the handsome man in its jaws. The pharaoh was filled with wonder, and the scribe related on to him what had happened while the handsome man stood waiting. Could have taken his chance to run, but I guess not. The pharaoh bids on to the crocodile once again to take the handsome man into the depths, and neither are ever seen again. Then the pharaoh gave the command that the wife of the scribe should be seized, and on the north side of the house she was bound to a stake and burned alive. Now, if you want to hear more wild stories like this, I recommend you subscribe to The Hive. For number nine, let's talk about the lore of the Catwoman God. Cats were very important to the ancient Egyptians and were even considered to be demi deities. Not only did they protect the crops and slow the spread of disease by killing rodents, but they were also thought to be the physical form of the goddess Beset. The Egyptian goddess of domesticity, childbirth, the home, women's secrets, women's physical pleasure, fertility, and of course, cats. It's for this reason she's depicted as a slender 
slender and lanky woman with a cat's head. Beset was the daughter of Ra, the sister of Sekhemeth, the wife of Ptah, and the mother of Mihos. It's believed that every day she would ride through the sky with her father, the sun god, and a watch over and protect him. At night, she would turn into a cat and continue her duty of protecting Ra, but from his greatest enemy, the serpent of Pep. And since we're already talking about it, number eight will be the serpent of Pep. According to the legend, a Pep was a powerful serpent deity who resided in the underworld and embodied the universe's destruction and chaos. Each night, when Ra's son Bo had to pass through the underworld before re-emerging at dawn, a Pep would absolutely hound the ship in an attempt to prevent the sun from rising. Ra, the sun god and king of the gods, fought a Pep every night, and the battle was always extremely intense, required all the other gods' help, and lasted the whole night. So to aid Ra in battle, the Egyptians would build wax representations of a Pep and melt them in the sun. Finally, it's Beset who conquers and destroys the serpent Apep. During one of these nightly battles, Beset, being the goddess of cats, aided in Apep's defeat by utilizing her powers in a different way than she'd done before. Assuming the form of a lioness, she jumps the serpent, shredding him to pieces and scattering the bones over the underworld. From then on, Ra was tormented nightly no longer. For number seven, you're going to hear the oldest origin of Cinderella and her red slipper. Rhodopis, as she's known to modern storytellers, was a Thradican Egyptian woman slighted by fate and rewarded by royalty. First sold in Aegea, Rhodopis is passed through owners before winding up in Egypt. The Egyptian man who possesses her treats her incredibly fair. He gives her lovely homes, lavish her with other gifts, but he spent most of his time sleeping. So she's sitting on the bank of the Canopic Nile, watching robes when a falcon suddenly snatches her sandal. Rhodopis is in awe, for she knew it was the god Horus who had taken her shoe, but wondering what the Horus appearance could mean. Unbeknownst to her, however, the falcon had taken it to Memphis and dropped the sandal in the lap of none other than the pharaoh Amasis himself. Possessed by the sandal simplicity, but beautiful red color and being an obvious sign from the god Horus, the king sent his men in all directions of the country's quest of all directions of the country in quest of the woman who wore it. According to Greek geographer and historian Strabo in his geography book 17.33, she was found in the city of Nocritus. Hearing the trumpets and gongs of the emperor, she had hidden in the bushes while other girls tried to force their feet into her sandal. But the emperor spots her and requests she come out and try it. Naturally, Cinderella style, it only fits her, and she pulled the matching one from her robes. The pharaoh and Rhodopis are united by the god Horus, and the servant girl becomes the next queen of Egypt, to whom Herodotus, Diodorus, and Strabo say the third pyramid of Giza was attributed to. For number six, we're getting another Grecian-influenced myth, that of Oedipus and the Sphinx. So the legend of the Sphinx is a famous Egyptian myth about a creature with the head of a human woman and the body of a lion. Sometimes the Sphinx is also depicted to have wings, but that's more of a Greco-Roman component. According to the story, the Sphinx was said to have been sent by the sun god Ra to guard the entrance of the city of Thebes. The Sphinx naturally, as you may know, guarded Thebes not only with its might, but with its mind, presenting a riddle for all those who approached it. And to anyone who could not answer the riddle, they would be killed. What was the riddle? What walks on four legs in the morning, two legs in the afternoon, and three legs in the evening? If you don't know the answer yet, I actually encourage you to pause the video and try some guesses before we continue. Let's see if the Sphinx would give you the slice and dice. Okay, so the answer is, drum roll please, a human who crawls on all fours as a baby, walks on two legs as an adult, and uses a cane in old age. Tricky, right? So the myth goes that a young prince named Oedipus, yes, the one who marries and does stuff with his mom, uh, came upon the Sphinx while traveling and he asked the riddle. Oedipus was the first person to be able to answer correctly, which angered and confused the crap out of the Sphinx, causing it to take its own life in a panic. However, some versions of the myth, the Sphinx was said to have been turned to stone by the gods. Number five, let's reuse, reduce, and recycle our rotten food. More questionable cure-alls. As I mentioned in point number eight, moldy bread was used by doctors for medical reasons such as medicine or gauzing techniques. This is because Egyptians, from what we can gather, seem to have figured out the antibiotic properties and believed the exposure of mold to a wound would better aid in the immune system for next time, if not at least help quicker healing process this time. But Egyptians also reused other rotten foods. For example, sour milk was also used medicinally, believed bathing in it would help with skin disease or dryness. I mean, all that sand is bound to have a little bit of a chafy effect. Honey, which also happens to be a natural bacteria killer, may not have been rotten, but it was put on open wounds, similar to how we use polysporin today. And while rotten donkey liver may not have been medicine, the Egyptians were quick to slather it on their head and get a nice even dye job. Number four in our countdown is a different kind of rotten, the casual neck. The Egyptians were known for their fascination with life, death, and sex. In their beliefs, the god Ra actually created the universe and the first two gods through masturbation. 
Osiris, another god who eventually came along, to became father to Horus posthumously after Isis had s with his dead body. Ra also had s with Osiris posthumously, but it seems his use of onion juice worked pretty well and he didn't father any children with the dead body. Now, just because it's in their godly pantheon doesn't mean just anyone was necrophilic in ancient Egypt, but those who were may have had that lust arguably feeling a little more justified in their pursuit of rotten ladies. So there was an issue with necrophilia towards the deceased bodies of Egyptian women, to the extent that their loved ones began a habit of letting their corpses sit out for two, three days before passing them to the embalmers so as to dissuade sex. The logic was is that the embalmers wouldn't want to have sex with the body that was already beginning to rot. I mean they shouldn't want to have sex with the body in the first place, but I guess beggars can't be choosers. Regardless, neck and bombers were apparently common enough for the Grecian writer Herodotus, who famously documented a lot of culture practices, to make special note of. Let's take a break from the funky stuff to talk about a different kind of pussy. Number three, the obsession with cats. Guys, I am super biased to this one. Don't know if you can notice the fine sheen of cat hair I rep, but I'm with the ancient Egyptians on the cat praise. Ancient Egyptians were obsessed with cats and even worshipped them. Believed to be gatekeepers of the underworld, these little beasts were spiritual and metaphorical symbols for Egyptians, and they were even believed to be gods themselves. The act of harming, eating, or killing a cat warranted a death penalty as a result. And while adoring your family pet isn't bizarre, the effects of worshipping something are. When the family cat died, every member in the household would shave off their eyebrows to mourn its death. And if a building was burning, people would save the cats before they even put out the fire. Being the first society to domesticate cats, Egyptians used cats for extermination aside from the companionship, which worked so well that their agricultural society dominated that of the Mediterranean for hundreds of years. Of course, there were cons to this obsession. For example, when the Persian invaders showed up using cats as shields, the Egyptian army retreated in fear of killing a cat, allowing the invaders to their soldiers and the pharaoh and take over rule of Egypt. Oops. Unlike other animals, cats were often mummified and buried in tombs dedicated to the goddess Bastet. Recovered cat figurines made of wood, stone, and bronze can be found in museums and collections all across the world. Number two is a modern day medical emergency, but to ancient Egyptians, it was just his time of the month. While it's astounding that medical accomplishments that Egyptians had made, specialized doctors, antibiotics, even surgery, you can see from their contraceptives in point six, Egyptians didn't always nail it. In fact, the disease Shitso Matsasia, we'll just call it by its second name, Bilharzia, was so common that they didn't even realize it was a disease, and it infected nearly everyone. How did it slip under the radar though? The side effects of the disease make people feel sick, and it caused blood in their urine and fecal matter. Seeing as menstruation also came with bloody urine and feeling sick, Egyptians simply thought they were menstruating, and came to accept that men had to do the same as women. Blood and urine became a normal part of growing up for boys, and Egyptian society was already very big on gender nonconformity, even having records of sex changes, so this really was an outlandish thinking to them. In reality, Bilharzia was actually parasitic worms having a field day in their junk. Irregardless, a man peeing blood was even treated as a sign of his fertility. No better sign a man was ready to father a family than being infected with parasites. Man, what a trip this countdown has been. You may be wondering what can take the cake. It's the ceremonial circle in at number one. So as prior mentioned, ancient Egyptians believed Ra to have created much of life and existence through, well, his masturbatory sessions. This was also believed about the Nile River, Egypt's famous river that flows 6,600 kilometers before it empties into the Mediterranean Sea. These ancient Egyptians believed that the flow of the river represented the frequency of Ra's ejection. Seeing as the Nile was the source of Egyptian agriculture, it was incredibly important that that flow remained. Well, it's 4000 BC, and everyday people don't exactly see their gods wandering around. So, with their pharaoh being the personification of God, the duty fell onto him. So, once a year in the last month of summer, during the festival Min that celebrated the pharaoh's rule, the pharaoh would approach the Nile, remove his robe, and master over the Nile River in a sacred public ceremony. He had a large retinue of men that would also match into the river at the same time as him. Once the pharaoh and his men had, well, finished, any man was welcome to unload in the river too. It was believed that these cultural and religious practices would ensure that the Nile would continue to flow for the next year to come, pun intended. Kicking off the list at number 10, 
the first zoo. Long before the pyramids were even built, Egyptians were getting quite creative. They were the first to see a petting zoo. How brave is that, if anything? Yeah, let's just start touching animals and then see what happens. Let's do it. 6,000 years ago, Hierakonopolis was the capital of Upper Egypt during the pre-dynastic period. It was beautiful. It was sitting alongside the Nile River, which was even more beautiful back then, you can't even imagine. And in those days, perhaps the best way to flaunt your wealth was by getting an exotic pet. Yeah, the old Mike Tyson trick. There were excavations done back in the late 19th century by English archeologists James Quibble and Frederick Green, and they discovered that this town was once thriving with over 10,000 residents. It's a lot of people. It's a lot more people than we ever thought. That alone is amazing. That's a historical feat. But when further studies were performed, they also found the remains of an elephant surrounded in cosmetics, surrounded in ivory bracelets and amethyst beads, the whole glorious, you name it, a worshiped elephant. That's odd. Then they found the remains of cats and dogs, also worshipped. The dogs, slightly more worshipped. Common pets, some crocodiles. Again, brave owners there. There's also hippos, leopards, wild ox. It was a wild time. They were carefully buried, but the broken bones suggested a cruel history sometimes. But most of the times, they were pets. Not as bad as we thought there. I'm like, oh, ancient pets? No, they're good. A lot of ivory. Number nine. King Tut's passing. Perhaps one of the greatest mysteries is of course the history of the young King Tut. Younger than we remember, honestly. The young boy became pharaoh at just age nine in 1332 BC. Yeah, what were you doing at age nine? I was mini golfing, maybe, I don't even know. During his time ruling, the young king had to face a country in conflict. Egypt and Nubia at this point were going head to head over land, and not even 10 years into ruling, the young pharaoh passed away at age 18. It wasn't until 1922 until he was ever seen again. That's when Howard Carter, of course, discovered the tomb of the lost king, appropriately, in the Valley of the Kings. This is where we could have been more careful, you know, historically, because when Tut was discovered, they tried to move his body out of the oil that coated the coffin, but in doing so, they got a little bit too excited, they didn't really know what they were doing back then, so they damaged him. Yeah, they damaged an ancient king. How brutal is that? So now it's next to impossible to tell what really took his life at such an early age, especially for a king. We have some ideas though. It's not entirely hopeless at this point. It was believed King Tut, after some 3D scans were done, had a broken leg. So he may have fallen off a chariot or something. So if King Tut passed at an early age out of nowhere, hopefully this was the reason why or else there's another mystery afoot. Number eight, the first peace treaty. The first peace treaty in history ever was back in 1259 BC. Now at this point, ancient Egyptians and the Hittite Empire were fighting over what's now modern day Syria. This conflict had been lasting for centuries. And finally, come 1274 BC, the Battle of Kadesh was now underway. Of course, there was tons of bloodshed, no clear victor in sight. So what's left to do at this point? For the first time ever, a peace treaty was agreed upon. Ramses II and King Hadassuli III both negotiated a peace treaty where both sides would aid each other if perhaps a third party decided to get involved. They saw their resources, they saw that they were lacking on both sides, so like, hey, we have no we have no shot, really. Let's just team up. A copy of the treaty can now be found in New York above the entrance to the United Nations Security Council chamber. It's also in the Guinness Book of World Records as the oldest peace treaty ever. That's how you know it's official, if you don't believe me. Every 90s kid watching right now is like, oh, really? Amen. That's a fact. That's a true fact right there. Those holographic covers. What a trip. Number seven, board games. I love board games a lot, even Monopoly. I have the patience for it every now and then. But ancient Egyptians, huh, talk about patience, my friends. They also loved board games. They created them. They got that board, kind of time. Dogs and Jackals, Mehen and Sinet, and 20 Squares, those are the classics. Mehen was played during the pre-dynastic period, around 2500 BC. Now the goal was to reach the center of the spiral, so we think we're trying to piece it together. The board was a coiled snake almost, pretty creative. Senate was the most popular game of all time. Queen and kings alike would play this one. Senate had a long board with 30 squares painted on it. Now of course the rules are still unknown, still heavily debated, just like Monopoly even today. But we have some ideas how Egyptians played it. Three rows of 10 squares, the last five are decorated, so it's assumed, like everything else in ancient Egypt, that this was themed on the afterlife. Plus, King Tut was buried with one of these boards. I'm gonna be buried with a GameCube or something like that. There's also some paintings of Queen Nefertiti playing Senate, so that's how you know it's a good one. It looks a lot like chess. Imagine playing a pharaoh in chess. God, I'd be so anxious. I'd be so nerve wracking. I wouldn't even play checkers with a pharaoh. That'd be too scary. I'm bad at checkers and chess. I don't know how to play chess. I'm lying to you guys. I've never played chess. I don't know how to. Number six, Akhenaten Moon. This queen was ruling during the 18th dynasty of Egypt. The pharaoh Akhenaten, well, this was his daughter. She followed in her father's footsteps and was a great ruler, but she was also the wife and half-brother of one King Tut. A pretty conflicted spot to be in, historically. Her and King Tut had the same father, but their mothers were different. Now, after Tut's death, however, it's believed this queen may have married the pharaoh Ai shortly after, and perhaps she's buried near him right now in the Valley of 
the kings. Back in 2010, DNA testing was being done in tomb KB21, and there were two 18th dynasty queens that were recovered from that tomb in the Valley of the Kings. Could it be, perhaps? There wasn't enough data that was found from the mummy, but they do know that the DNA is somewhat of an 18th dynasty royal bloodline, so we're definitely close. In another tomb, tomb KB63, numerous coffins were found, and one had an imprint of a woman on it, along with jewelry, women's clothing at the time, but the biggest clue really at this point was pottery fragments. Of course, it's always in the pottery. We've all played Ogre enough time, always check the pots. The name Potten was on one of these pottery fragments. That's another clue. The only person to ever use this name historically was the long lost queen, of Akinasunaman. So now we're getting real close. Dangerously close. But it feels weird to watch so many tombs be opened up at this point. Like, yeah, we're getting close to finding out things historically, but can we just leave these leading ladies alone? I feel like they dealt with enough men in their lifetime. Now we're just like, Boof. we're like, hey, is that her? Nope, we're good. It's like, eh, let them rest. They have fake doors. They don't want us coming in. And why not wash all that? sand down with a whole lot of flood water. Egyptians actually recorded, measured, and tracked the Nile River, and to do so they created their own series of measurements, the Nilometer, and a governmental cataloging system that could track the Nile patterns through the centuries of information, the Palmero Stone. While the blessings of the Nile were many, there were such a thing as a little too much. Too high of a flood could destroy dikes, irrigation works, settlements, food stores, and livestock, increase epidemic diseases, and endanger seed stocks. Low or short floods didn't always reach some of the farmlands, which then as a result reduced the wetted area, the degree of soil saturation, and the amount of fertile silt deposited. But it would increase the salt concentration of the waters reaching the fields along the desert margins. This all reduced the cultivated area as well as the unit productivity, whether too wet, too dry, or too salty, and resulted in food crises ranging from food shortages to straight famine and plague. And naturally, the agriculture and fields were always the first affected by floods, which would immediately affect crop quality, its quantity, and thus income. Some theories mention that the decline after the dynasty and at the end of the old kingdom occurred because of food shortages and famines, resulting by the flow of inundation. In the tale of two brothers, when inundation confines the men and beasts within doors, the younger brother seats himself at the loom and weaves. Why? Well, this is my smooth segue into talking about how blue collar carried all. As it still does nowadays. Shout out to my blue collar workers, you're seen, essential, and loved. Anyways, to paint a picture, let me read a short segment of the instructions of Duakete, which dates back to the Middle Kingdom. The field hand cries out forever. His voice louder than the raven. His fingers have become ulcerous with an excess of stench. He is tired out and dealt the labor. He is in tatters. He is well among lions, but his experience is painful. The forced labor then is tripled. If he comes back from the marshes there, he reaches his house worn out, for the forced labor has ruined him. This is just one of the many very fun literary resources that detail the haggard existence of the Egyptian blue collared field. There was even an, an ancient Egyptian papyrus found, and it turns out it's a letter from a scribe of Amun Ra listing reasons to his son why he should become a scribe and nothing else because everything else sucks. In describing the miserable life of a herdsman, it said that they were all worn out with constant toil, bad food, and the dank air of their habitat. He lived near marshes with his cattle. He had no settlement, home, a misery, lonely reed hut sheltered him at night and held all his worldly goods, a rush mat to sleep on, and clay water jar and basket for his house. Head. Sometimes the Nile would flood as discussed and destroy a farmer's whole career. When summer came and the fish left, fishermen had to find new jobs. When drought arrived, artisans and clay makers had to shift focus. To survive, you have to be a master of all crafts, but with a limited education. Thank God you're only struggling to eat, fighting disease and climate disasters all while getting taxed out the wazoo. So biographies of the Middle Kingdom tombs shed light on the tax collecting activities of nomarchs. While an important administrative text, the papyrus Brooklyn de deals with the four labor. From this we know until the first millennium BC, taxes were paid in the form of grain, cattle, and other commodities. The first coinage money is introduced in the 26th dynasty. Current officials regulated the yearly taxes, and the officials' main function was to ensure that the peasants paid their taxes either by persuasion or even by physical force. Taxes were not based on how much acre that had been produced that year. Remember all that Nile measuring? Surprise! Taxes were based off the result of inundation. Each year, the agricultural census off officials were sent to measure the croppable area and gather a list of the institutions and private owners who held that land. This enabled them to estimate the year's crop and probable tax. Once the crops had begun to grow, other inspectors returned to make the final tax evaluation. Don't pay your taxes? Well, security will swing by with switches, a type of painful stick bundle, and punish you. There were many reasons for not paying taxes. The harvest or the tax itself is stolen from you, too low of a harvest, crop spoilage, and political 
instability. In the late period, there was also another solution to pay tax or overdue loan, which means to sell yourself for labor. And what do you know, just like nowadays, unreasonable tax led to heavy corruption, aka royal profiteering, everyone's favorite, and Egypt was full of it. In the case of the whole erecting pyramids and 30 foot self statues, if that wasn't distinctive enough. Following Hashpotet's death in 1458, Egypt's only interest was profiteering, backed by the constant threat of violence. Nothing was done to create a sustainable system of provincial government, instead a teetering hierarchy of greed, nepotistic officials and priests squabbled over positions and power. They memorialized themselves and advertised their family's greatness in corrupt expenditures much like the prodigy houses of the Elizabethan England 3,000 years later. One such official was Rechmeyer, vizier to Thutmose III and his son Amenhotep II. This swaggering bigwig, who literally wore a big wig to prove his status, built himself an extravagant memorial chapel at Thebes and a monument showcasing his status, paid out of the profits of the high office. Because internal theft was endemic, a consequence of staggering inequality pervasive in Egypt at the time. Of course, there's no point in judging a Bronze Era nation by the standards of today, but, if, but in Egypt, the gap steadily widened as the elite abused its power. Egypt's kings and high officials happily took from other nations and even each other, and kings defaced or demolished their predecessors' monuments, absorbing their achievements and sometimes even helped themselves to rationalize grave robbing. And where there is corruption, there are spoiled Nepo babies. Many, well actually most of Egypt's kings pretty much popped out of the womb and were sat on the throne. The 18th dynasty is one of the most notorious for this, fathers seemingly dropping like flies and their young sons taking over. But despite literal children taking the throne, the system of divine myths surrounding the royal line was so embedded it allowed such young kings to rule unchallenged. War profits were mostly spent on conspicuous waste, but helped create an illusion of permanence. State vanity building projects were designed to glorify the regime as part of that mirage. Amenhotep III built a sprawling palace complex on the west bank of the Nile at Thebes with courts and pylons fronted by Colossi depicting himself. At Karnak, Hashpotet erected several obelisks honoring herself and Amun, her divine father. Khufu, son of Snerfu, decided to one up his old man and commission the Great Pyramids of Giza, one of the last standing seven wonders of the ancient world. Pepe II was only six years old when he became king of Egypt and he behaved exactly as you would expect a six year old to. An explorer told him that he had found a pygmy and he ordered the man to bring it to the palace so he can see for himself. His attitude never changed with age. He was the one who used to cover his servants in honey and make sure that the flies wouldn't bother him that way. And don't forget Ramses II, who was completely obsessed with making a name for himself, building multiple cities in his name, a museum called the Racinium, and he would even quite literally scratch out the names of previous pharaohs and write his own on their accomplishments. The guy was so childish after horribly losing the battle of Kadesh to the Hittites and barely escaping with his life and being forced to sign a peace treaty, he had a massive mural commissioned showing his miraculous triumph. Number 10, mummies. This should come as no surprise to anyone, but yeah, mummies. Well, not the first and not the last civilization to mummify their friends and family, ceasing to exist, they are probably most known for it. Well, that and maybe the pyramids. The pyramids are pretty cool, I guess. The process of mummifying or preserving the body was thought to be important for the soul during the afterlife. If the vessel or your body was not intact, then your soul could get lost. Therefore, if you want the pharaoh to live forever in the afterlife, then you must pickle and preserve the mighty king. I don't want my soul getting lost. Number 9. 40 Year Old's Worst Nightmare Despite my best efforts and anti-aging cream, there will come a time when I will be old. Personally, I'm not worried about putting some mileage on. That's life. However, something I am concerned about is the effects of aging. Have you ever just noticed that he ain't as limber as he used to be? You get tired easily. And if you have more than three beers, you have to lay down for three days. However, something that happens to a lot of men reaching their 40s is a little trouble in the bedroom. This was an issue in ancient Egypt, except sadly, there wasn't a messed up process to fix impotence. I know, right? That's crazy. You thought I was going to say something weird like wrap a snake around it or something. But no. When in modern times, the cute waitress at the golf clubhouse just doesn't get your blood pumping anymore, you could reach for a small blue pill that everybody knows. Egyptians did not possess such luxuries and instead prayed for the Pisha deal to work. Dear Desert Jeebus, please make my wiener work again. Thank you. Number 8. Ahead of their time. Ancient Egyptians just may have been ahead of their time and didn't know it. The Egyptians had tons of different herbs, plants, and methods for treating all kinds of ailments. 
their alchemy skill was maxed out. I never did that. However, one method they came up with may have been helping more than they thought. A porridge mixture that was boiled down that contained tetracycline, which just in case you didn't know, is known as an antibiotic. This would have been very helpful for the time, as a scrape on the knee could be the difference between living and well, not living. While this was being used, it's unsure if the Egyptians really knew why this method worked. We doubt they understood the finite details of antibiotics, and I'm not gonna stand here and pretend that I do either, because I don't. Number seven, Tales from the Crypt Keeper. <laughs> you didn't think I was gonna talk about mummies and not talk about how they make them, right? Hold on to your spittoons, this is gonna be a rough one. Okay, so we all know that when we pass on, our bodies begin to decay and break down. The Egyptians knew this, so they would have to be one step ahead if they were to have the king pickled in time for the afterlife. Well, first things first, the brains? They gotta go. They would remove the brain with a large spike and sort of just, sort of mash it up there and just, well then they drain the contents from the nose, which, that is just disgusting. Stomach, colon, and lungs, well, those won't be needed in the afterlife either, so they gotta go too. But the heart? The heart stays though. That's where the soul is. The king was then dried out with mounds of alkaline salt and the world's best beef jerky impression. Afterwards, oils were rubbed into the skin and eventually a resin was applied to aid in the linen wrap sticking to the body. Making for that distinct Tupperware brand airtight seal. The pickled king was wrapped numerous more times just to be safe and then, if he was OG enough, placed into a sarcophagus. And if you're really cool, you'll get your own room full of gold and treasures and your pet whiskers which is a cat, and be mummified because, well, you need him in the afterlife too. That is one heck of an undertaking process. And to be fair, it kind of worked because there have been a few mummies recovered from Egypt and they're in amazing condition, considering the age, of course. Number six, a little off the top. Okay, without the comment section oversharing here, some people have had circumcisions and some haven't. It's a part of life, okay? Just. That's how it goes. Debatable to some, but it happens. This was a common practice in ancient Egypt, claimed to be for hygiene reasons. However, there's something a little bit different about their process. See, today it happens when you're a baby. A strange man comes in the room, and he cuts what he has to cut. It's done, there it is. That's it, it's over. Egyptians waited a little longer, however, closer to the age of 12 or 13. Can you imagine just chilling in the field one day and then some strange dude grabs you and slaps you down on the table and makes a withdrawal from you to make you veg? I talked to the chief today and he just said that's that's not it. Don't, don't do that. But don't worry son, as long as you live, dad's gonna pick your career. Young men didn't get jack bleep in the way of choosing what they wanted from the day their little man got snipped. They were harassed about marriage by their mom incessantly and dad's always yelling at them for not holding the Dandera flashlight in the right spot so he could see more properly. This is because once a man is viable for marriage, he needs to be prepared to support his partner. A father's rule became about teaching his son's living skill. Herodotus and Diodorus often refer to a hereditary calling in ancient Egypt. Not a system of rigid inheritance of a career, but an endeavor to pass on the father's function to his children. If dad teaches you glass blowing primarily, but also woodwork and butchering, then you're gonna start as a glass blower and use your time outside of it to learn and integrate into the trade you prefer more. Maybe it was butchering or woodwork, but maybe it was something different altogether. A son was commonly referred to as the staff of his father's old age. By mastering his father's trade before one of his own, at insured as dad ages, son can take care of the family business if it's more lucrative and supports his father better that way. By the way, for this reason, adoption was huge in Egypt. And once you're an adult with a family to support, you'll learn how currency was nightmarish. Up until the time of the Persian invasion in 525 BCE, the Egyptian economy operated on a barter system based on agriculture. The monetary unit of ancient Egypt was the deben, and it was approximately 90 grams of copper. Expensive items could also be priced in deben. So, like if a 75 liters of wheat cost one deben, and then a pair of sandals also cost one deben, it made perfect sense to the Egyptians that a pair of sandals could be purchased with a bag of wheat as easily as a chunk of copper. Even if the sandal maker had more than enough wheat, she would happily accept it in payment because it could be easily bought 
bartered in exchange for something else somewhere else. The most common item used to make purchases were wheat, barley, and cooking or lamp oil, but in theory almost anything would do. Beer was the most popular drink in ancient Egypt and was frequently used as compensation. The lower class of society produced the most goods used in trade and therefore provided the means for the entire culture to thrive. Even if it did mean going to the market required bringing just as many bags of things with you as you were going to leave with. And since I mentioned beer, life in Egypt would be impossible unless you liked liquor. Wages were paid primarily in grain. Thanks weird Egyptian currency system, just what I wanted to bring home after a 10 hour labor shift. A 6 pound bag of barley, which was then used to make the two staples of the Egyptian diet bread and beer. Beer was made from barley dough, so bread making and beer making happened simultaneous. Egyptians made a variety of beers of different strengths, which was calculated according to how many standard measures of liquid was made from one hecate of barley. Thus, beer of strength 2 was stronger than beer of strength 10. These divisions were made because there was no 100% clean drinking water, so everybody of all ages drank beer all the time. And what's beer cause? Bloating, weight gain, heartburn, liver issues, and if you're predisposed exposed to any of these things and you have to spend your life drinking beer, make sure not to jump up and down, you're probably going to combust. But don't worry, if the beer has you feeling like crap, you definitely had access to laxatives 24-7. An investigation by the UK's University of Manchester and the Egyptian Medicinal Plant Conservation Project provided findings that laxatives were an accessible and normally product by ancient Egyptians. Doctors in ancient Egypt believed the human body should be regularly flushed out to prevent disease and clean the intestines, not just in times of illness. Many Egyptians Egyptians took this advice and used castor oil to force waste out of their body. Figs, bran, and dates were also used as laxatives in ancient Egypt, and one ancient remedy to relieve excess gas and indigestion was cumin, a hefty portion of goose fat, and milk, boiled together, strained, consumed. Metcalf, a scientist in the Manchester University School of Medicine, adds that the Egyptian use of bowel stimulants such as the bitter fruit coxin and castor oil remained in clinical use until about 40 years ago, so the amount of crapping would have definitely made living in ancient Egypt crappy. And naturally, what's worse than being terrified to leave? Like the people of Mesopotamia, India, China, and Greece, ancient Egyptians lived in modest homes and apartments, raised families, and enjoyed their leisure time. A significant difference, however, is between Egyptian culture and that of other lands was that the Egyptians believed their land was intimately tied to their personal salvation, so they had a deep fear of dying beyond the borders of Egypt. It was thought that the fertile dark earth of the Nile River Delta was the only area sanctified by the gods for the rebirth of the soul in the afterlife, and to be buried anywhere else would be to be condemned to non-existence. Those who served their country in arms or those who traveled for a living, saved money, and made provisions for their bodies to be returned to Egypt should they be killed. However, due to this belief, as we know Egyptians were not amongst the world's great travelers. There's no Egyptian Herodotus, Elvia Chalabi. Even in negotiations and treaties with other countries, Egyptian preference for remaining in Egypt ensured everyone had to come to them. Even within the confines of the country, people did not travel far from their places of birth, and most, except for times of war, famine, or upheaval, lived their lives and died in the same locale. It's believed that one's afterlife would be a continuation of one's presence. The yard and tree and stream you saw every day outside your window would replicate your afterlife exactly. So Egyptians were encouraged to live gratefully within their means and care for their environment and never leave. Number two, Ramses II with a vengeance. As some of you may know, Ramses II was the greatest of the rulers of the 19th dynasty and second longest reigning pharaoh ever. He lived to the age of 90, was an amazing warrior, leading the armies of Egypt by the age of 22, and has literal tons of statues of himself all over Egypt. He is also probably a lot of people's ancestor since he had 96 sons and 60 daughters approximately. So yeah, it was kind of a big deal in 1881 when archaeologists discovered his mummy with a whole bunch of other ones in a secret chamber at Deir al Bari. Originally, Ramses was buried in the Valley of the Kings, as he should have been. But because of the risk of grave robbings, he was moved to a secret chamber. And then, after his discovery and stay at the museum in Cairo, he was moved again in the 70s when he got a passport to travel to Paris. This guy gets around. Number 9, Rosetta Stone. You are too fine to be laying down in bed alone. I can teach you my language, Rosetta Stone. Man, we all miss the old Drake. 
Girl, don't tempt me. Anyway, speaking of diamonds in the rough, the Rosetta Stone. Pretty, pretty shocking and important find. What is it? Well, basically, it's a large stone tablet that has the same paragraph written on it in three separate languages. Why is this so important, you may ask? Well, it's basically helped us learn everything we know about ancient Egypt. More specifically, translating Egyptian to Greek and then to English. Or, since it was discovered by some of Napoleon's people and forces, uh, it would have been in French. To put it in modern terms, it's as if you were back in grade 11 reading Shakespeare and not understanding a single word. But then the bully in school finds the cliff notes for Romeo and Juliet and decides to do a nice thing and share them with everybody. Yep, that makes sense. Good euphemism. That's a good one. Number 8. Khufu's Ship when pharaohs passed on into the afterlife, they put a whole whack of stuff inside their tombs that were meant to come with them into the next plane of existence. It's why we see the mummified versions of their favorite cats and dogs, favorite foods, and tons of treasure. Unfortunately, after you're gone and buried, some opportunistic people are gonna bust down your tomb doors and steal all your stuff. I'd like to see those grave robbers steal what Khufu brought with him. In 1954, archaeologists found out that, among other things, Khufu had a 140 foot boat with his name on it, buried in pieces at the base of the Great Pyramid where he was entombed. It was almost perfectly intact, and after digging it out of the ground, they put it on display at the Solar Boat Museum, right next to where it was buried. Hopefully, that's close enough for Khufu to still use it in the afterlife. Number 7 Mummy Workshop. Here's a recent discovery for you. Archaeologists in 2018 discovered a well preserved embalming workshop complete with labeled oils. Ooh. What's an embalming workshop, you ask? Well, it's the place where kings go to shed a few pounds. Ooh. By that, I mean have their organs removed to be pickled in jars for the afterlife. My favorite part of this process is removing the brain. Because, you know, you don't need that. Lots of folks walk around without those all the time. Basically, you get a long hook surgical tool and you find the good pink stuff up here through the nose. After stirring the pharaoh's memories like an Italian baker mixing bread dough, you flip the royal over and just let that all drain out till she's empty. I legitimately get queasy when talking about this stuff, that's not a joke, I, I seriously do. But you know what, I'm glad we found the place and smarter people than I understand it. All I know is that if an Egyptian embalmer asks you to lick the spoon, you say no. Don't do it. Number 6. Construction Manifest You know, a lot of people include the Great Pyramids of Giza on their list of Egyptian discoveries. But like, how, how, could, how could you miss them? You know? What stumped people about the pyramids is how they were built. So for our next discovery, how about the discovery of a port in 2013 that had a piece of papyri? Isn't that so much more exciting than a massive 138 meter tall building? Mm hmm. The piece of papyri actually was a sort of manifesto for those massive buildings. It basically said, the limestone used in the Great Pyramid was shipped from a quarry at Tura to Giza along the Nile River. It also said that it took four days, and it talked a little bit about how long Khufu was in charge of Egypt and the guy who was in charge of building the pyramids. See, it's, it's very exciting. Now segueing back into the gods, number five will be about Osiris and Isis. Egyptian ruler god Ori Osiris and his wife Isis is one of the most well-known and revered myths. Osiris was renowned for his intelligence and generosity, two things his envious brother Set lacked. Lying to be king, Set lured Osiris to the Nile, where he enticed Osiris into a coffin and tossed it into the river to be swept away. Devoted wife Isis diligently searches for Osiris and discovers the coffin near Balbos, which is in modern day Lebanon. Isis returned with Osiris' body, but concealed it amongst the reeds of the Nile. However, Set had been tracking her and steals the coffin back and chops Osiris' corpse up and throws the pieces everywhere. Isis persisted in her quest for her husband's body. She finds all the pieces, reconstructed Osiris, and bombed his body, got pregnant off of it really quick, and brought his soul back to life with the assistance of her sister Nephthys. Osiris became the deity of the afterlife, ruling over the dead in the underworld. So naturally, that would bring us to number four, which is Horus versus Set. The story is told in the Chester Beatty Papyrus No. 1, Contendings of Horus and Seth, which dates back to the early Middle Kingdom, but the myth most likely has origins even earlier than that. So upon bombing Osiris, his son Horus is conceived and then born. Thoth and Shu declare Horus the rightful ruler of Egypt, but Ra argued that Seth was more powerful, therefore deserved the throne. So cue a massive battle. First, they have a hippo breath holding competition. Isis gets involved and as a result, Horus feels betrayed by his mama and cuts her head off. Then Seth gouges Horus' eyes out while he's asleep and Hathor has to return them. The judges wanted the 
the two gods to make amends since crap is getting petty. So they do, but the wily Seth decided to seduce Horus for a scheme. So very R-rated stuff goes down between the men, but Horus is smart and collects the seed of Seth instead of having it go somewhere else. He brings the seed to his mother, Isis, who proceeds to freak out and cut off his hand. And then she collects some of Horus' seed in a bucket for revenge against her brother Seth for trying to trick Horus. How? She goes to Seth's garden, finds his favorite lettuce, and dumps the seed all over it. So here comes Seth, post lettuce lunch, declaring to the judge council he had performed the labor of a male against Horus, so he should be king. Horus is like, nah, -uh, I did it to him, and the other gods are like, okay, well, let's ask the seed then. So Seth's seed had been disguised by Isis in a marsh, and it responded from there. Well, Horus' seed, eaten on lettuce, replied from inside Seth. So Seth is pissed. He says they need to do another contest. It involves sailing stone boats down the Nile, and Horus cheats, making a wooden boat look like stone. Seth finds out, loses it, demolishes Horus' ship. Finally, enough is enough. They used to have been duking it out for 80 years, and everyone is tired. The gods appeal to Osiris in the underworld as the final decision maker, and he obviously chooses his son Horus to rule, not the guy who killed him. Alrighty, up next is number three, and that is the weighing of the heart. According to the story, after death, a person's soul would be carried by the god Thoth to the Hall of Mat, where it would be judged by a panel of gods, including Anubis. Being the deity of embalming and mummification, Anubis played a significant role in the weighing of the heart ceremony. He was accountable for ensuring the deceased body was appropriately respected and readied for the afterlife, as it was he who operated the scales. My personal favorite depiction of this is seen in the TV series American Gods, which paints a visually stunning and poetic scene of Anubis weighing a heart. So, the soul and the heart of the deceased would be weighed against the mat feather, which represented truth and justice. If the soul were pure and sinless, it would be permitted to enter the hereafter, but if the soul was laden with guilt, it would be devoured by a meat, a hideous beast comprised of a lion, crocodile, and hippo. This next story is a long-winded one. It's number two, the secret name of Ra. So, Ra was known by many names to the gods and humans alike. However, he had one secret name which gave him his divine power. The goddess Isis sought equal power to Ra and devised a plan to obtain that secret name. Having grown old, Ra couldn't speak without spit running from his lips, and Isis one day collected the soil it fell upon. She baked it into the form of an invisible venomous serpent, which she placed in the path of Ra. When the invisible serpent strikes him, burning venom runs through Ra, who collapses in pain. He's brought to his bed and demands all his godly children come to him. His children run to his bed in sorrow, and unto Ra spake Isis, saying, I shall weave spells, I shall thwart thine enemy with magic. Lo, I shall overwhelm the serpent utterly in the brightness of thy glory. Thou must even now reveal thy secret name unto me, for verily thou canst be delivered from thy pain and distressed by the power of thy name. Hotter than fire burned the venom in the heart of Ra. Like raging flames, it consumed his flesh, and he suffered fierce agony. Isis waited and waited until Ra, desperate in pain, accedes. It is my will that Isis be given my secret name and that it leave my heart and enter hers. When he had spoken thus, Ra vanished before the eyes of the gods. The sun boat was empty, and there was a thick darkness. Isis then received in her heart the secret name of Ra, and the mighty enchantress screamed out for the departure of Ra's venom and the relief of his agony. And so the god Ra was made whole once more. The venom departed from his body, and there was no longer pain in the heart or any sorrow. He and Isis were now equals. And we've made it to number one, which will be the heavenly cow. Arguably one of the most famous Egyptian legends, its most preserved version is found in the tomb of Seti the First. Ra was getting pretty up there in age, and mankind, his own creation, stirs up a rebellion against him because of it. Ra is deeply hurt. Mankind sought to kill him and assembled the pantheon of gods, asking their advice. Should he kill all of mankind as a punishment or just remove himself as they request? The gods bicker a bit, but the consensus is reached. Let thine eye go forth against those who are rebels in the kingdom, and it shall destroy them utterly. When it cometh down from heaven as Hathor, no human eye can be raised against it. Upon the advice of the council of God, Ra sends his daughter Hathor, the fiery protective sun eye, to kill the rebels. The goddess rejoiced in her work and drave over the land for so many nights that she waited in blood. Blood that begins to horrify Ra. The god repents, his anger fading, and he sought to save the rest of mankind from his daughter. His messengers run to fetch barley, which is turned into beer and mixed with the already spilled blood of man. He commands the jars then be spilled at the site where the vengeful Hathor rests 
rested for the night, so that when Hathor awakens, her heart is made glad. She stooped down and in her literal bloodlust began to drink eagerly, not knowing the red fluid was not blood, but beer. By the time she finished, Hathor was too drunk to pay heed to any of mankind, and returns to the palace to be with family as they ask her to. Ra, however, is now far too weary to remain among men. He settles down with that family and shares the news of his earthly departure for the sky and calls upon his father Nu and the goddess of the heavens Nut to aid him. Nut takes the form of the celestial cow and ascended up, carrying Gra to become the son of all earths. Mr. Unpopular, Xerxes I, is number 10. Xerxes is one of two pharaohs on the list who wasn't actually Egyptian, and it ultimately puts Homi in some hot water. He ruled during the 27th dynasty whilst Egypt was a part of the Persian Empire, having the throne from 486 to 465 BC. These Persian kings were acknowledged as a pharaoh despite not being Egyptian, so Xerxes the Great, as he was known, earns a place on our list by virtue of fame. He wasn't so great to the Egyptians though. He had a disregard for their traditions and religious beliefs and allocated funds away from their temple. He also banged his niece and gave her the robe that his wife had made for him, so his wife had her sister-in-law mutilated as revenge. It was this whole big scandal. But it caused Xerxes' brother to try and usurp him, something that Xerxes was already dealing with constantly as back at home in Babylonia, as well as in Egypt, people were trying to steal the throne away from him, causing him to ping pong back and forth between the two places. When he wasn't doing that, Xerxes was failing disastrously at trying to invade Greece. Eventually the embarrassment of his consistent failure to do so and the endless coup attempts on him was a bit too much and Xerxes abandoned the Egyptian throne. His failed attempts to invade Greece ensured that his portrayal by Greek historians and by extension the film 300 hasn't been very kind. Number 9 is a famous hussy, Ramses II. This man could not keep it in his pants. Sure, 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 he was the greatest leader of the 19th dynasty and an amazing tactical mind and made Egypt prosperous, blah, blah. He's the son of Seti I and Ramses went on to declare himself a god and the ruler of Egypt for 67 years before dying of natural causes at 90, which is an insane number for an era where the life expectancy was 30. But homeboy was not a modest pharaoh by any means. He was a lying two-faced politician who based his entire campaign on a laundry list of fabrications. The extensive architectural legacy of his reign are thought to have left the throne close to bankruptcy at the time of his death. Before getting to that ripe old age, as mentioned, Ramesses spent any free time he had Banging. Enough to sire between 100 to 200 children in his lifetime. He even outlived 12 of his sons. Ramses was one of the first rulers to take on the title of the Great before it was cool. All in all, he was pompous and spoiled. He left behind more statues of himself than any other person in the history of the world. He was obsessed with outshining all those who came before him, and he would tower over all those that would follow. Speaking of testament to ego, number eight is Khufu, the son of Seneferu, which I'm probably butchering, who is the first pharaoh to build pyramids. Khufu was on a one-upping mission since day one. He commissioned the Pyramids of Giza, one of the last standing seven wonders of the ancient world, which by the way we learned not too long ago is lopsided. The pyramid was originally covered in white limestone adorned with gold and since stripped away by greedy tourists over the last 4,000 plus years. He used his platform to also establish mining and trade from what's now modern day Lebanon. Unfortunately, while he brought greatness to Egypt in ways of infrastructure and economy, socially he inspired a lot of mixed reviews due to his use of forced labor and a dismissive nature. The ancient Greek historian Herodotus was a particular critic, depicting Khufu as a vicious tyrant who used slaves to build his great pyramid. Now, many Egyptologists believe that these claims are merely defamatory, guided by the Greek viewpoint that such structures could only be built through greed and misery. If those rumors are true, then Khufu had high expectations and forced labor and no one liked him. If they're not, then he wasn't a bad guy at all. Number seven is Cambyses, the animal hater. This this is the other Persian pharaoh on our countdown, and he too enjoyed picking on the Egyptians he ruled, but in a very indirect way. See, Cambyses enjoyed watching animals suffer. It said in his spare time he put on fights between lion cubs and puppies and made his wife watch as they tore each other apart. In fact, nearly every story coming out of Egypt at the time of his rule told about Cambyses involved him ruining the life of one animal or another. Early on, he went to see Apis, the bull that Egyptians treated as a god. Right in front of the priests dedicated to Apis, he pulled out a dagger and just start stabbing the bull until it died, laughing at them and saying, this is a god worthy of the Egyptians. What a prick. 
Number 6 is Menkuar, the pharaoh who refused death. Even though the title of pharaoh calls them undying and the pyramids are built to take them to the afterlife, you can't blame a person for still being fearful of what happens after they close their eyes for the last time. 25th century BC pharaoh Menkuar is the poster boy for that fear. An oracle once came to him and reportedly told him he only had 6 years left to live. Menkuar was terrified and decided to do everything he could to avoid it, even fool the gods. His biggest plan revolved around the idea idea that as long as night never came, a new day could never start. If a new day doesn't begin, time couldn't pass so he couldn't die, right? Right. Anyways, on this basis for the rest of his life, he lit up all the lamps he could and convinced himself it was always daytime. He would not sleep and force countless serfs to suffer with him this way. Every night, he stayed up drinking and celebrating the success until the day he died, because the gods will always have the last laugh. Number 5. Queen Nefertiti's Disappearance Ruling alongside the pharaoh Akhenaton from 1353 to 1336 BC, Queen Nefertiti, aka Lady of Grace, aka Hereditary Princess, was born born in 1370 BC. She was born in the Egyptian city of Thebes. She was only 15 years old when she married 16 year old Akhenaten. Again, always so young and just forced this family forced fun. She worshipped the sun god Aten at the time, and alongside her young husband, she built a new capital called Armana. She even created a new religion, it was on some good stuff. She ruled over what's now considered the wealthiest period in Egyptian history. Nefertiti had six children, which were all daughters. Many believe this has something to do with her disappearance. After reconstructing Egypt's religious and political structure, soaring to new heights as a woman in the Egyptian court, the queen just vanished. Yeah, historically, just like that, boom. During the 12th year of the 17 that her husband ruled for, historical records seem to have just wiped out the queen's side of the legacy. She was gone from everything, and many believe that she didn't actually die, but rather, she disguised herself and continued to rule. See, the next in line after Akhenaten's reign was Pharaoh Smenkeher. Was that really Nefertiti in disguise? I hope so. That's like some she's the man stuff right there. The reason we believe she may have disguised herself as a man is because of the female pharaoh, Hepshaput. She ruled with a fake beard in the 15th century, so it's possible. We've seen it. And lastly, there's a theory that the reason Nefertiti was banished was because she couldn't produce a male hair. Like I mentioned, she had six daughters and then she disappeared. This is, this is ancient history we're talking about. Always brutal, no matter what. Beautiful, but brutal. Number four, Cleopatra's. Sure, she may have been born in Egypt, but Cleopatra, despite what many believe, was not Egyptian. She was the last Greek ruler of Egypt, and after Alexander the Great's death in 323 BC, Ptolemy then took over Egypt, which in turn launched this wave, this dynasty of Greek rulers that lasted for centuries. DNA-wise, she was barely Egyptian, but as she grew up, she was determined to learn all about Egyptian culture. And due to political structure, she started to style herself after the god goddess Isis. She was the first Cleopatra that claimed to be Isis after the third Cleopatra. Yeah, there's way more than we think. There's like seven. Number three, King Ramses VIII. The last son of Ramses III. He's the seventh pharaoh of the 20th dynasty. King Ramses VIII. Yeah, history is confusing with these numbers sometimes. I gotta tell you, I had to type that one out a few times. I was like eight, third, carry the eight, nine, Ramses what? The lost king had the throne for a very short amount of time and historians are trying to understand why that is. What exactly happened? When the King Joffrey went wrong with King Ramses VIII here, he was the only pharaoh of the 20th dynasty whose tomb is still lost in the Valley of the Kings. So maybe it's not even there. And the thing is, with his ruling being so short, the theory out there is that the tomb of KB-19 that belonged to the son of Ramses IX, many believe this tomb was originally built for Ramses VIII. But once he became king, everybody saw his true colors. They must have changed their mind at that point or changed their lane or something. They were like, eh, maybe not him, you know? There is a confirmed tomb that was never used for Ramses VIII, and that was tomb QB43. That was in the Valley of the Queens. It was made for him, but never used. Again, more mysteries. Oh, the poor souls who had to build all these tombs, and they're like, you don't need it? Okay. 57 years to make that tomb. You sure you don't need it? Okay. Number two, baboon police. Ancient Egyptians worshipped lots of animals. We mentioned that earlier. They had zoos and elephants surrounded in ivory, all that good stuff. At one point or another, you've heard about how cats were highly respected back then, worshipped. But they also worshipped other animals as well. Sorry, cat people. Yeah, other animals are fun, like baboons, believe it or not. They were pretty important pieces to this ancient Egyptian puzzle. Egyptians had tattoos of baboons all over them. This was before Harambe, you know? Anyone monumental like that ever came around. The most famous piece of history that we have preserved is in the collections of the British Museum in London. There's a mummy on display, and it looks a little slightly different than the rest. EA6736, fun name, but he was recovered from the Temple of Cones in Luxor, Egypt. This little man dates back to the New Kingdom period, so anywhere around 1550 BC, to 10 BC. Yeah, 
He's quite old. Baboons would appear in art and religion all over ancient Egypt, and one of my favorite facts ever has to be that in ancient Egyptian times, pharaohs would train baboons to make arrests. Yeah, imagine stealing food and trying to run away, and then you look back and there's four baboons doing parkour behind you, telling you to stop resisting, hucking bananas at you. That's crazy. And number one, false doors. Imagine searching for a lost Egyptian tomb your entire life, all right? Imagine you spent years of your life dedicating everything to this research, and you finally find this door, this ancient door. You find an entrance carved into the wall. This is it. What lies beyond? You try and carefully open it with a team of archaeologists, but it won't budge because it is a fake door, my friends. It is a false door. Yeah, you just got juked out from a guy 4,500 years ago. He's like, gotcha. <sighs> Took long, we did it. False doors in ancient Egyptian tombs are very common. Ancient Egyptians believed that these false doors were a connection to the dead. How beautiful is that? And that is how spirits were able to travel from here to there, and back and forth. See, most false doors can be found on the west wall because Egyptians believed the west to be the land of the dead. The west, that's the west. Which way? Which way is north? Your west, my east. How does that sound? There we go.